the Archbishops of Canterbury and Pope Francis have called today a global day of prayer for peace in Ukraine. And so let us pray. Lord God, you make wars to cease to the end of the earth. You break bows, you shatter spears, you burn shields with fire. And Lord, we call on your name and ask you to save the lives of many people in Ukraine who live this day in fear. Lord, we thank you that your perfect love scatters all fear. And so we pray for an outpouring of your love. Lord, we pray that you would de-escalate this crisis, that you'd turn the hearts of those who are bent on evil to seek and pursue peace. And Lord, we pray that you would bring a peace that lasts, a peace that is strong and not weak. Lord, we pray you give wisdom to the leaders of the nation to find a solution. And Lord, we pray for ourselves as we may feel helpless and uncertain as to what we can contribute. Lord, that you would give us wisdom that together our actions would be working together in step for peace across the world. Lord, we pray that we would find ways to bring support to those who are in need and those who've been displaced. And we pray tonight for our meeting of the council that you would give wisdom, that there would be a sincerity of an integrity of words and action in all of our doing. And Lord, we pray that our meeting this evening would be for the welfare of all people of this borough, that each and every person would flourish and know the fullness of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I remind members of the need to respect each other? And I will continue to chair these meetings thoroughly and to show impartiality. Likewise, members of the public are welcome but should be aware that they should not interrupt the proceedings as disruption may result in removal from the public gallery. As this is the budget meeting and one of the most important meetings of the year, we need to give it our full concentration as we owe this to our residents on setting the council tax. All group leaders have been offered separate briefings about the budget. The rules of conduct for the meeting have been circulated in advance of the meeting and copies are on your seats. Apologies for ab absence. The Chief Executive of the Wingate and Apology. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Apologies this evening are Councillor Dewhurst, Councillor Draper, Councillor Holland, Councillor Rotherham, Councillor Watson, Councillor Collinson. Do we have any further apologies this evening? Minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of December 2021. I will move the acceptance of these as a correct record. Leader. Just a second, madam. No amendments have been received on the minutes. Can I put the minutes to the vote, please? have been carried. Item three, the Mayor's announcements. Before I begin my announcements, I would like to say how precious democracy is and how sadly we see it is challenged in conflicts across the world. The Ukrainian crisis is a stark reminder of that and we stand in solidarity for all those affected by conflicts across the world who are forced to flee or fight for freedom and democracy. Mayor's breakfast. I would like to advise the council of a mayor's breakfast to be held on Thursday, the 24th of March at 8 a.m. in Aspel Methodist Chapel. Donations will be collected on the door in aid of my charity. You have each been given a tube of Smarties to enjoy this evening. If at all possible, 
Since then, we used all the tutoring to qualify excuses and return it to me by the next meeting at full council in aid of my charity. New Year's Honours List. I wish to congratulate the Vice Lord Lieutenant of Greater Manchester, Sharman Burfield, on receiving an MBE. May I also congratulate Mr Stuart Parsons on receiving a BEM for his services to the music and library sectors. Congratulations on these prestigious awards. The Mers Ball. Can I advise members that the Mers Ball will be held on Saturday, the 2nd of April 2022, and will be held at Pillar Court, Worthington. The event will again be organised by the Charity Committee. It is a black tie ball and the proceeds from the event will go to the Mayor's Charity. Tickets are still available via the Charity Trustees. Workforce Wellbeing Charter. Wigan Council has been awarded the Workforce Wellbeing, Wellbeing Charter. This award demonstrates the commitment to the well-being of our workforce right across the organisation and the council will now be listed on the National Register of Award Holders. Well done to all involved in attaining this award. National Apprenticeship Awards. Wigan Council was shortlisted in the Employer of the Year category for the Apprenticeships in Leadership and Management, in addition to Health and Social Care. Jade Lawrenson from the Reablement Team won the Health and Social Care Award. Congratulations to everyone involved in the awards. Death of former councillor and honorary freeman of the borough, John Edward Hilton. It is with deep regret that I refer to the death on the 30th of December 2021 of former councillor and honorary freeman of the borough, John Edward Hilton. John represented the Goulburn Ward and became a member of the then Planning and Development Committee in 1974 and went on to become its chairman from 1983 to 2000. He also served on the Education, Policy and Public Protection Committees. His commitment to the environmental issues was legendary, with Wigan being the first metropolitan borough in the country to publish a nature conservation strategy and he was instrumental in preparing the borough's green strategy through his chairmanship of the local Agenda 21 committee. For all these achievements, John was made a Millennium Freeman of the Borough in 2000, the highest honour which the council is able to bestow. In 2001, John became Wigan's 28th mayor with his mayoress, his wife, Nora. During his year as office, he raised funds to help the Royal Albert Edward Infirmary for the benefit of patients across the borough. I now invite members of the council to express their condolences in respect of John Edward Hilton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I first met John some 40 years ago, uh, and I think every member regardless of party, you know that when you first take your seat in this chamber, it can sometimes be a quite lonely place. Uh, and certainly, you always look for someone who will show a bit of kindness and a bit of guidance, and John was certainly that person for me. I served with John on, for a number of years on planning committee, uh, both as a member of the committee and as vice chair, and then went on to, I went on to become the chair. John, if, I started, if you started to read and put everything together that John had achieved during his time in, in service in local government, you could certainly fill at least three or four pages without a problem. John was an excellent servant for this borough and certainly was proud of, of, of his heritage with Goldburn. And I think, as you know, Madam Mayor, he was such a figure in Goldburn politics for a great number of years. And certainly when he was chosen uh, for the Millennium uh, Freeman of the Borough, it wasn't taken lightly. It was taken because of the work that he had done continuously on behalf of the borough. John was a family man, an excellent man. He had a, a nice family, grandchildren who worshipped him, and certainly he'd be sadly missed by, by all the family. And he'll certainly be missed by me, and he'll certainly be missed by my family, because he was very close to us. John was absolutely brilliant in terms of representing this borough 
both within the GM reg region and nationally. Uh, and he's still now, when I speak to people who were around at the same time, very highly thought of in terms of his contribution uh, to setting the stall out. Certainly, uh, he was instrumental at the beginning with the Red Rose Forest, which some members still uh, understand and, and what it meant to, to us as a borough. So, Madam Mayor, I'd like to place on my on, on record my thanks and my condolences to John's family for sharing John with us for a number of years in this council chamber. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Leader. Death of Councillor Anita Thorpe. It is with deep regret that I refer to the death on the 1st of February 2022 of Councillor Anita Thorpe, Ward Councillor for Lee East Ward. Anita joined the council in 2011 to represent the residents of Lee East and was a member of the Building Stronger Communities Scrutiny Committee before it came the Confident Places Scrutiny Committee and also the Licensing and Regulation Committees. In 2014, she became a member of the Audit, Governance and Improvement Review Committee before it became the Ordinate Governance and Standards Committee. In 2019, Anita also became a member of the Confident Council Scrutiny Committee. She leaves behind her daughter, Tracy, and grandchildren, Chloe, Shona, Josh, and Elizabeth. Anita's son, Gary, sadly passed away three years ago. The funeral service took place on the 24th of February at 1 p.m. at St. Mary the Virgin Church, Lee. I now invite members of the council to express their condolences in respect of Councillor Anita Thorpe. Councillor Cunley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Anita was my friend for well over 30 years. First met her in a little room above Abbey Street Labour Club at a meeting, and we became good friends. And throughout all that time, she's been a good loyal friend to me, and I've been a support to her. She said to me one time, many years ago, when I first stood for the council, she said, oh, I'd never be a councillor. And then 11 years ago, we managed to persuade her to stand in Lee East. And she really found her, 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 something that fulfilled her life because she was always working on behalf of the community. She was always fighting injustice. Um, she was like a dog with a bone with anything she picked up, you know. Um, she didn't have an easy life, uh, Anita, and she brought up Tracy and Gary on her own uh, as a single mother um, due to her uh, marriage breaking up. Um, and she worked at Ward and Blackstone and um, actually as she got to later life, she took the opportunity to do a degree in criminology. And she was successful in getting a degree in criminology and worked as a lecturer at Bolton uh, for quite a while. Until she retired. But Anita was um, somebody who was always trying to help people and do things for people. Anita was brought up on higher folds. And I remember leafleting in higher folds and she was telling me which house in Windsor Avenue she'd been brought up and talking about higher folds. And she always had an affinity for Higher Falls, and in fact was the chair of Higher Falls Community Centre, something that she really got engaged in. Um, when, when I say she did all kinds of things for people, so Anita volunteered at Aberton Lee Food Bank, she ran a Golden Years Dining Club for pensioners on Higher Falls on a Friday, she ran a Monday afternoon bingo club session uh, for her pensioners. And I, I don't think you have to be a pensioner to go there, but primarily they were pensioners. And then she arranged trips for them out. And in fact, the last trip she went on was a trip to Blackpool that she organised just before Christmas for all the uh, people in that club. And um, <coughs> to many people, Anita's death was a shock. But I've known since last year and Anita knew she was terminally ill. 
and they shall have six months to live. And Anita said to me, I don't care about that. I'm just going to carry on doing what I'm doing. Fighting for people, trying to get them justice. She was even dealing with constituents' complaints right up to days before her death. And that's the type of person she was. A caring person who bravely fights. And when I say she was like a dog with a bone, and I mentioned this at the funeral, a few years ago, she, dealt, she went to see the people at the top end of Holden Road, near Green Lane Chippy, because people were concerned about the number of cars parked in front of their houses, and it's big here in the Chippy. And she said, well, there's a piece of land on the corner of Holden Road and Manchester Road that's just a big piece of spare land. We could make that into a car park and then people will not be parking on Holden Road. I said, well, first of all, Anita, I'm not sure that it will stop people parking on Holden Road in front of their houses when they go into the chip shop. And, and I'm not sure in these days of austerity how the council are going to find the money to build a car park. Three or four years she battered on. She must have harassed every officer in this council for three or four years. And eventually that car park was put there. And from the very day it was there to, the, to now, I've always called it Anita's car park. And that, that will always be Anita's car park because she was so insistent on resolving everybody's issues and everybody's problems. In fact, once on social media, somebody put on that Councillor Anita Thorpe had not, han not answered the email that was sent to her. And she actually tracked down the woman, said, how dare you say I don't respond to emails? I've never had your email. And I think it was something around uh, a slight problem with the email address that she'd not received it. But Anita went on and dealt with her problem. She was forthright. She was brave. Um, she really found her role as a councillor. She never aspired to any great position. Her satisfaction was serving the people and serving the community in which she lived. And she did that right up to the end of her life. She was an amazing person. And I said at the funeral, if anybody deserves the title of the people's champion, that was Anita. She feared North... No fear, no favour, she would represent everybody who she felt wasn't being dealt with rightly. And even on this council, I think it was reported in the press one time, when she, on scrutiny, they were talking about the service of the council and the call centre. Anita led into a real tirade about how she was on the phone calling the call centre actually cooked her tea and ate her tea before they answered it. You know, so she wasn't afraid. She would stand up to anybody and say anything. But she was forthright. And she was brave to the end. She carried on knowing that she had very few months left. Her son Gary died three years ago. Her sister died several months ago. So she's had a lot of no trouble in her life, and I like to say it's not been an easy life. And interestingly enough, she said to me, uh, I spoke to her a couple uh, on the Tuesday before she died. I'd spoke to her, and she said, "That doctor's been round my GP, and he said you'd said initially, do not resuscitate if you have a heart attack or a stroke or anything." He said, "Do you still want that to happen?" And she said, "I certainly do." She said, I do not want to die and have somebody banging on my chest, bringing me back to life, to die again. I'll just die the once, thank you. And that was the bravery of her, because she's lived the last seven, eight months knowing that she is terminally ill. And she was in difficulty and been in hospital a few times, but she carried on regardless, representing her constituents, representing a community, running those things, volunteering at the food bank, 
throughout all this period. And I think she'd been a credit to her family. Her family are proud of her as she was proud of them. And she'd be a sad loss to the people of Lee because she was Lee born, Lee bred, Lee through and through. She loved her family, she loved Lee, and she loved its people. And she'll be a sad loss to this council. Thank you, Councillor Cunley. Are there any other members wishing to speak? Councillor Walker. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Just to add, as another ward colleague, um, <coughs> I often had to bear the brunt of some of that doggedness. Um, and it wasn't easy sometimes, to be honest because she wouldn't let things go. Um, Keith made that simple point, but it, it, I can't emphasize too much how when she, when she got hold of something, she just would not let it go. And I know that officers have given in. You know, I've pointed this and said, no, Anita, we're not doing that at the moment we haven't got the money for that but she's nagged so much that, that some of our officers have given in a bit like that car park that, that you know would never have happened in the normal circumstances um, but that was Anita through and through but she was particularly proud of the uh, community centre at higher falls so she was the chair of that and i was a, a member of the the board with her um, and <coughs> again she would never let go and she assumed that everybody was going to be as committed as her and one of the things that she struggled with was when people let her down and people do uh, and I, if she had a fault, her fault was in believing what people told her, absolutely. And one of the things, of course, as a counsellor that you learn over a period is that some things are so incredible that you think there's something missing in the tale that's been told you. Uh, but, and... I always, when, because we, we, we had, sur we have surgery three, three Fridays a, a month and we always have a, a, a share there of, of some of the issues um, and main, mainly the blow by blow accounts of, of what Anita's been up to. But she could never understand it when people didn't tell the whole truth. They just told a bit of the truth. Uh, and and it, it was just her, she just had absolute faith that they wouldn't, they wouldn't dream of, of, of not telling you everything. And, and you know, that everything they said was right and every failing that was wrong was the council. And sometimes it wasn't. But, but every time it wasn't, she was just so disappointed in people letting her down. She didn't, she couldn't come to terms with why people do things like that. And it, it was just part of her makeup. You know, why wouldn't you tell the truth? Why wouldn't you tell us the whole story? But uh, it, one of the things that I can't help but remember, because one of the things we do in, in Lee at election time, um, in the run up to the election for about six or eight weeks before the election. We meet most evenings um, and we, we deliver for the different wards in, in Lee. Um, and we normally meet on the town hall car park and then we, we move around the different wards. Uh, and Anita started slowing down and started using um, a, a, a support um, but she had two beautiful granddaughters 
who, but and, and I can't believe them now how big they are and and you, you, you know they they're almost adults now they feel like it but they used to be there and she was so proud of them and they were running up and down every path uh, and you, you know they wanted to show to their grandma that that they you know they were fully into this and she absolutely loved that as part of her family life she will be greatly missed by all the people in lees and in lee in general so farewell dear friend thank you councillor walker you wish to speak yeah councillor taylor thank you uh, thank you madam murphy and with me uh speak in this rather sad occasion uh, if it's okay i'd like to share a little story with the members uh, a few months ago uh, a work colleague of mine uh, said could i help with a, a, an issue so i said yes of course i can and the issue just happened to be in anita's ward so i rung anita up explained the situation and she says, oh, there's no problem with that. And we, we just started talking, and she says, yes, she says, I'm at the hospital at the moment. She said, they just told me I've got terminal cancer. And there was this silence, because how do you answer something like that? But it needs to be an Anita, she did that as well. She says, don't worry, Barry. She says, I'll make sure I sort this case out. And that is Anita, a counsellor to the very end. Sadly missed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Are there other members? Councillor, thank you. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'll not be long. Uh, a fitting tribute tonight to Anita, I think, encompasses all what Anita was about. Obviously, I only knew her a short while, the four years I've been, since I've been elected. But she came across as a very hard-working councillor, committed to a... a her communities, and in the committee, committee meetings that we were together, I thought she was an independent, really. The way she go on and fought for a, 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 a constituents for her was unbelievable. And she'll be sadly missed by ourselves on this side of the end, uh, chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gerard. Councillor Wynne Stanley. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. And, um, uh, as well as adding my condolences to what's already been said, I would also like to add my condolences about John Hilton as well. I didn't get in at that point, and uh, I just wanted to offer my personal condolences to the leader as well, because I know how close he was to John. And John was obviously uh, my ward councillor for many, many years, as long as I can certainly remember anyway, up until him retiring from the council. Um, unfortunately, I didn't know Anita as, as well as, as obviously some other members here uh, have have obviously articulated how well they knew her. But what I do know is how dedicated she was to her local community and how hard she worked on behalf of her residents, as did John when he was on the council as well. And unfortunately, we have had quite a few councillors and former councillors who, who've passed on. And um, it, unfortunately, this is becoming a bit of a bit of a problem. So I hope that we uh, can end this run of bad luck that we've, that we've got. Uh, for losing councillors and, and former colleagues because no matter who we are when we come into politics and when we serve our the people who we represent we're, we're trying to do our best for them and i think we can certainly see that from from john and anita so on behalf of the conservative group my uh, sympathies and prayers to the families and friends of all those um, who were affected by this thank you madam mayor thank you thank you councillor win stanley Death of Councillor Paul Maiden. It is with deep regret that I refer to the death on the 20th of February 2022 of Councillor Paul Maiden, Ward Councillor for Hindley Green Ward. Paul joined the council in 2018 to represent the residents of Hindley Green Ward. Paul was a member of the Licensing and Regulation Committees. In 2019, he became a member of the Planning Committee and in 2021, he also became a member 
of the Health and All Adult Social Care Scrutiny Committee. Paul leaves behind his mum, Helen, and his dad, Tony, as well as his brother, Danny, and sister-in-law, Paula, and his nieces, Abby and Jess. He also leaves behind uncles, aunties, nephews, his good friends and colleagues. The funeral service will take place on the 10th of March at 10 a.m. in St. Jude's Catholic Church. There will be a full requiem mass. The burial will be at 11.30 at Gidlow Cemetery. I now invite members of the council to express their condolences in respect of Councillor Paul Maiden. Councillor Gerard. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. It was a great shock, uh, even of Councillor Maiden's death uh, a couple of weeks ago. We both came, got elected together both in 2018, and just after speaking to Paul, before we both could take on the world together, really, as you do when you first get elected. And uh, I've never seen a person so committed to uh, what he believes in. I mean, he came with a reputation, and I hope the reputation he leaves us with is that he was someone who was committed to the cause for his con uh, constituencies and the benefit of his ward. He fought for things like Clay Hill Park, uh, road safety. You know, he, he was a, a true champion of people for that Wheel of Green Ward, and they'd be sadly missed. Uh, just want to offer my condolences to his family. Uh, it's sad news, 44 is no age at all, and uh, he'd be sadly missed by ourselves, and more importantly, by the people of Inlingham. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gerard. Councillor Breeley. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Yeah, Paul, well, we met Paul in 2018 when he got elected. Um, very strange man, very passionate and very committed, like uh, Councillor Gerard said. Uh, there wasn't a sort of side to Paul, he was a keen fisherman. Um, had many occasions with his dad and Paul, went on a few fishing trips with him. He was a uh, very competitive competition with his dad, like I mean, and he was really good. Um, I think he's, what he's going to be remembered for is fight with the Wigan Council and the market traders. He was so passionate about that. And uh, he really looked after people. He went down, he talked to them, and time after time and time, he fought their corner. And it's a shame that he's sadly passed away. He'd have been doing the fight now, even though he shut the car park. He'd have been there fighting the, the corner for them. And, you know, he will be sadly missed. And right up to the very end, um, he served his community well and he gave a community group a much needed workshop shed and I believe they're going to name it after him um, which is a good honour anyway thank you Madam Mayor Thank you Councillor Breeley Are the other members wish to speak? Councillor Hulton <clears throat> Thank you Madam Mayor uh, I can only reiterate what's been said by colleagues tonight. Um, I knew Paul for a very long time. I never knew him away from this chamber. Um, we were very political together. I've known him for years. We used to stand outside and give our opinions on what had happened before he got elected. And then when he was elected, I would get a phone call after the meeting and we'd, we'd hash through what had happened. And I have to agree with Bob, he was unbelievably committed to his ward, something that one can only aspire to. Uh, the, the several things he was involved with, and the market traders is the one that screams the loudest to me, he was unbelievably committed. He'd phone me up, I'd say, I know, try this. And it's a devastating shock, really, for his family. He 
was a decent man. He was a good counsellor. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Councillor Hilton. Our other leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and just to echo what's been said, and there's one thing about Paul, we'd have heard him tonight. I think there's no doubt about it. If Paul would have had something to say tonight, he'd have, he'd have been here. And I think it's always sad when someone loses their life so young uh, and had so much to live for. So, although our political differences were probably miles apart, can I just say and have my condolences on behalf of the Labour group uh, to Paul, his family and his friends, because I know they will sadly miss Paul's input in terms of, he always had a vision and, and a view on everything, so I know that Paul would have said something uh, positive to a lot of the people who spoke on his behalf tonight. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Leader. I have written to offer condolences to families and our thoughts go to all families for their loss. At this point, I would request the Council to observe a minute's silence in respect of former Councillor and Honorary Freeman, John Edward Hilton, and Councillors Anita Thorpe and Paul Maiden. Thank you, members. <coughs> Item four, declarations of interest. In accordance with guidance issued by the Department for Leveling Up, Housing and Communities, formerly the DCLG, members who are council taxpayers, own properties, or are tenants in the borough do not need to declare a DPI in the setting of the council tax since these do not materially affect their interest in the land. This does not apply to those persons who are more than two months in arrears with council tax, and so these people, if any, will have to declare this. Members should note their personal interest for the following. School governors, members of Greater Manchester Transport Committee, formerly TFGM, Transport for the North Scrutiny Committee, Parish councillors, if any, and Lee Sports Village. Members are asked to consider other DPIs for the purpose of this meeting and any other personal and prejudicial interests. You will have to leave the room at the relevant part of the meeting. If there are any further declarations, then please fill out the relevant form if you need to declare an interest at this meeting and return this to Democratic Services at the end of this meeting. Item five, the mayorality. This item is deferred. Item seven, policy and budget framework. Revenue and capital budget framework and council tax setting. Members are asked to note that as this is the budget report, we are required by regulations to have a name vote on any motions and amendment to motions on this item. The leader will speak for the length of his presentation and in doing so, will invite his cabinet to speak on the relevant area on his behalf. The council is requested to cons re consider the recommendations as set out at page 20. The report was considered by cabinet at its meeting held on the 17th of February 2022, and the views of the Confident Council Scrutiny Committee were also taken on board 
at a later meeting of the cabinet that day. I now invite the leader and his cabinet to present the budget and to move all recommendations. Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Can I first start, Madam Mayor, by thanking Paul McKevitt, the finance team, my cabinet colleagues, and the SMT. Uh, the, I, think, I think we've all understood as much as we can about local government finance over the years, but uh, I think now it's very clear that the government has made it very clear that they expect all councils to raise any funding through the council tax system. But despite the challenges and the circumstances we continue to face, we are proud to deliver a budget that includes flagship schemes supporting our communities, and that is in line with the deal principles. When we start to think about the continued financial pressure that everybody's feeling now, we're probably facing the biggest cost of living rise in a lot of people's memories. So it is always difficult when you have to start talking about raising council tax. But I'm pleased tonight that we're going to announce a balanced budget. We're going to announce a council tax of 1.99%. And in line with other years, we have taken the government's advice to increase the council tax by 1% to cover adult social care. Uh, and I know very well that my deputy leader will uh, be speaking about that in his presentation to the council. But I'm so proud of the, the achievements that we have made. Uh, and despite all the pressure that we continue to have, we'll be making a number of announcements tonight, which will certainly show the commitment of this council for its people. Tonight, we'll be announcing a major investment going forward in our social housing, delivering over 770 properties into the social, social housing and affordable homes sector and Councillor Gambles will cover that in her presentation. Once again, Madam Mayor, if you remember, as we came out of, uh, we were in the middle of it actually, the COVID pandemic, we announced about supporting our communities. And once again tonight, we're going to announce additional funding in the Community Recovery Fund. And Councillor Reedy will cover this in his budget presentation. I'm pleased to announce that the work is now well underway with a new youth hub in, in Lee at LSB. And this is a significant statement in terms of what we want to deliver for young people across the borough. And Councillor Bullen will touch on that in her presentation that she does tonight. Last year, we launched our town campaign and it showed our commitment to our district centres. We are now pleased to say we're going to announce the rolling on of that project into other districts that didn't get covered in that last uh, our town uh, bid that we put forward. And I think as part of our cleaner, greener borough, uh, we're going to make a real effort in the other districts that I think there's 12 districts plus Wigan and Lee town centres. And Councillor Prescott will touch on that in his presentation. We do, we do look forward to a year full of confidence in delivering our priorities to residents that, that went on and through the big listing events for Deal 2030. And I'm hopeful that the year 22-23 municipal year will be a successful one for the borough. I know at the time when many people in many sectors, including local government, are concerned about job losses and their careers. We are making a positive statement tonight. There'll be no cuts to services, no job losses. And I am pleased to announce on top of what we announced last year, a further 100 apprenticeships and graduates within the council over the next two years. And I know how much that means to a lot of young people in this borough and shows our commitment to the private sector and hoping that they will follow suit 
in giving young people in particular opportunities into training and employment. We have some great events to look forward to in the borough in this year. And I think we touched on it last time. Unfortunately, the pandemic got the better of us again. But this year we will see in 2022, the Women's European uh, football taking place at Lee's, Lee's Sports Village. And we also have at Lee's Sports Village and the DW Stadium, the Rugby League World Cup. And that certainly puts us once again on the world sporting map in terms of what we can deliver here in the borough. Also this year, we'll be granting the Freeman of the Borough to the Duke of Lancaster's Regiment, and that ceremony will take place in May. I was privileged, Madam Mayor, as you were, to be at Lee Town Hall only a few days ago, it seems, when we presented uh, a star to Joe and Margaret Gal Galvin for all the work that they have done successfully over the last 50 years in supporting young people through Lee Harriers. And it was very fitting on the, on, the, on the week that we presented the star that Keely Hodgkinson, as many of my colleagues know over there, broke the indoor world record, which was absolutely fantastic. And Margaret and Joe were so proud of what was achieved on that night. Also, Madam Mayor, I'm pleased to announce that this year we're going to honour two fantastic charities that work in our borough continuously over the last 10 years. And this year we're going to place two stars in Belief Square. One for Joseph's goal and one for joining Jack. And I think people will appreciate the work and the prestige that they give to this borough for the work that they do in the charitable sector. Madam Mayor, tonight we'll be presenting a balanced budget and I will now ask my colleague, Councillor Raymond, to present the budget to us to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, we haven't yet drawn the line under COVID. The uncertainty, financial challenges and COVID fatigue are still here with us with the challenging months and year ahead. No doubt, the effects of this pandemic will be felt long after it disappears, but we have started the journey to recovery for a stronger, more prosperous and a healthier Wigan. Building on our relationships with our communities, dynamic businesses, excellent schools, hardworking staff, and above all, our resilient people, this budget is the foundation of our vision for a more inclusive, greener, and a fairer Wigan. Madam Mayor, I'm not going to pretend that this budget was brought forward without any pain. This has been one of the hardest budgets we've ever set. It's been prepared in the backdrop of a multitude of challenges, the cost of living crisis, the climate crisis, and the Brexit crisis. Madam Mayor, last two years, obviously, have accelerated the decline, but it's not the pandemic which created these challenges. The pandemic has just exposed and widened the cracks in an already crumbling system of welfare, social care, housing, and health. As Leader said, this government expects local councils to increase council tax and put precepts up to fulfill their duty of providing children's services adult social care, highway maintenance, and refuse collection. Currently, we have a 27 million pound overspend in our children's services, an overall gap of nine million pounds, and our adult social care needing an additional three million pounds every year, which means that even a maximum allowable tax increase wouldn't even cover the increase of our social care cost. And just to reiterate, this is how this government expects local councils to provide statutory services and support our most vulnerable groups. Colleagues, since the austerity began, this council has had to cut 160 million pounds from its budgets, and that's 484 pounds per head in this borough. We are rightly proud of our record of having frozen the level of general tax 
for a consecutive six years. However, because of the government's clear move to funding councils through council tax rises, we had to take the tough decision of increasing the council tax this year. Therefore, Madam Mayor, we propose to increase the general council tax by 1.99% and take the adult social care precept of 1% recommended by the government. Madam Mayor, let, let me simplify our proposal. Most of our properties are in band A. They will be paying 27 pound extra per year. That's two pounds 25 per month. And for a band D property, it will be an increase of 40 pounds per year. That's just above three pound extra per month. For the few, this increase is affordable, but for most of our residents, this will take the toll on their overstretched and tiny budgets. We know that many more people will be moving to universal credit and many more will be losing their jobs. And a national insurance hike will hit our working residents harder. But we are ready to support them with our generous welfare offer and our council tax support scheme. Madam Mayor, once more, even after the proposed increase of 2.99%, Wigan remains the lowest council tax in Greater Manchester, the lowest in the Northwest, and the lowest among metropolitan authorities across the country. Madam Mayor, this government has betrayed local authorities of all political colors, cutting general funding and introducing ring-fenced pots of money, pitting local authorities against each other, to fight for that money with no regard to need, deprivation, or tax base. And I hope this is not how this government intends to deliver on their leveling of agenda. Madam Mayor, unemployment is on the rise. More families are relying on universal credit. Wages are stagnant. Energy prices have more than doubled. Supply chains are disrupted. And local economies are limping. And Madam Mayor, there is a real fear that communities let down by a decade of austerity will also miss out on the recovery. Inflation has risen to more than 5% and expected to get worse. In-work poverty has skyrocketed and it would be naive to expect that these challenges will disappear on their own. These are national, rather global challenges and not unique to us. But in Wigan, where we can make a difference, where we can address these issues, we are ready and willing to act. Addressing the rising demand in social care, both in adults and our children's services, addressing the cost of living crisis with our welfare offer, not relying on borrowing and using our cash to meet our expenditures wherever possible, and above all, being responsible with our public money. Colleagues, when our neighboring authorities are, and many others, across the UK are cutting their frontline services and are balancing their books by making job losses and using their reserves. This Labour Council remains committed to stand by our struggling families and to invest in Wigan, its communities and its people. Our financial management is competent and our treasury function is resilient. We are ready and willing to initiate, facilitate and kickstart the recovery, and this is how we are going to do it. Madam Mayor, this Labour group realises that our elders deserve better care, dignity and respect. We believe that our ageing population shouldn't be abandoned in hospital corridors, waiting to be discharged with no care packages in place. So we are going to invest an additional two and a half million pounds per year for the next three years in adult social care. And this is to improve outcomes, foster enablement, and less reliance on the long-term care. Madam Mayor, the lack of housing is becoming a national scandal. And locally, we have more than 12,000 people on our waiting list. To address this, we have an ambitious plan of house building. This will not only kickstart our economy, it will provide more employment to our residents and benefit local businesses. Since we declared our climate emergency in 2019, we remain committed to our pledge of planting one million trees. Madam Mayor, our commitment to our young people and children in this time of uncertainty remains of paramount importance to us. So after successfully delivering more than 100 apprenticeships in the last 12 months, the leader has pledged to deliver 
another 100 for our young people and graduates. Madam Mayor, financial challenges in the last decade have brought us even closer to our communities. Through our deal principles and while dealing with COVID, we have reinvented and strengthened our bond with volunteers and community groups. Since the pandemic started, we have recruited more than 1,000 volunteers. So we are going to invest more in the Community Recovery Fund so they can keep on enriching our social and economic fabric. We value local identity and local pride. Our residents have where they live. So we are injecting half a million pounds in our town fund, which will be spent to revitalize town centers. And it will move to new townships this fiscal year. To tackle the scourge of antisocial behavior, we are committing to more investment and resources in our estates. And finally, Madam Mayor, I'm sure I'm speaking on everyone's behalf in this chamber when I thank our staff and officers for their hard work, dynamism, and agility. I particularly want to thank Paul and our wider finance team for being proactive and robustly managing our finances. I want to thank our leader for his leadership and every member of Team Wigan for their commitment and passion to deliver the best for our residents in very challenging circumstances. Madam Mayor, I will take a moment to remember and pay tribute to our colleagues who were here with us in this chamber in this meeting last year, but are not with us anymore. So, Madam Mayor, more investment in adult social care, more money for our looked after children, more initiatives for our green agenda, a hundred more apprenticeships, more investment in improving highways, a renewed commitment to tackle antisocial behavior, more investment into our towns, more carbon free developments, no job losses, no cuts to our frontline services, with the lowest council tax in Greater Manchester and the lowest council tax in the Northwest. Madam Mayor, once again, I am delighted to commend a balanced and a financially robust budget to this council tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Raymond. Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't need to follow that one. That's quite a uh, brilliant speech. Well done. Uh, can, can I just say that I honestly believe budgets are about bringing money in rather than just taking money out. Uh, so that's what I'm going to base, what I'm going to talk about today. I think we all realise that the coming years are going to be really difficult for our community and residents. With rising food prices, energy prices, who knows what the next few years holds for all of that. But we'll all have to be there to help people through as we did through COVID. Over the past 12 years, we've invested heavily in our communities with staff, resources and finance to the tune of 12 million pounds. Out of the Community Investment Fund, the Wigan deal was born. And we all know the impact the deal has had across the borough, in fact, the country and interest from across the world. People have tried to copy it, but could never match our initiative because of the investment and the deal that we put forward. When the pandemic hit our borough, we were better placed than more authorities across the country mainly because of the fabulous communities, residents, staff and businesses and members in this chamber who, who actually created that base with the investment that we put in. Within hours of the dreaded COVID, our communities jumped to action to help the most vulnerable residents and that continued through many, many months with groups and council staff doing it their way. And of all, all of us have been affected somewhere by COVID, whether it was through bereavement, illness, isolation, and the list is endless. None of us could have known what the next 18 months held for us all, but we got through it the Wigan way. We increased our volunteer base to a massive number, and we have now got the task of trying to retain those. All our clubs suffered ma massive losses through membership subscriptions and still have our outgoings. So we knew we had to help those clubs and volunteers to get over that period. And that's when the leader launched the, community, uh, the COVID recovery fund with relatively small pots of funding to bridge the gap and encourage new groups. This proved very successful, and most of you in the chamber will have evidence to prove this. When we then replaced that with a, COVID, a community recovery fund, creating a new chapter after COVID. And I've got to mention 
within that, the work that Douglas Valley Properties do because it's a kind of, it's one of our secret armors behind the scene who actually look after our community centers and, you know, we've just met and the work that, we're, that they're going to have to do as we move forward is going to be vast. So I want to make note of the thanks to what the work they do behind the scenes. Culture, within our culture team, uh, they've worked tirelessly through the pandemic. A lot of other authorities kind of ditched this kind of element and got on with it. We didn't. We carried on working behind those scenes and the cultural map for us across towns uh, has proven that. And when I talk about expectations, what we've done, the, some of the things that we put forward was the Wigan and Lee Arts Festival, the Walk with the Mall, the Late Night Floating Earth, which brought the world to Lee, uh, are just a few. And today, the culture team working for the last 18 months whether it be internal and external within the community have brought a tune of £6 million to this borough, and those are things we don't see behind the scenes, not coming out to our budget, coming from external funding, working with our communities and organisations. So thanks to them for the work that they've done, it should not be gone unnoticed. Uh, leisure, when we took the difficult decision to bring leisure and wellbeing services back to the council, it was kind of a strange time because it was within COVID, uh, and, and a lot of the things were, were closed down and the industry suffered massively because of COVID. But we took that decision in order to protect jobs and protect the services for our, our communities. And residents told us they rely on this service, so that's why we did that. One of the things that people don't realise, and I would encourage people uh, in this chamber to go around to the centres and I can take them around whenever they want, is the impact that that now is having on our communities and working with our health providers and working out there. And just examples of that, doing lots of work with people with COPD, and I think we're gonna be seeing a lot of the long COVID stuff and cancer rehab. So there's lots of stuff goes on behind the scenes in leisure centers and work outside. I had, I had the pleasure, if you can call it that, to go out with a member of staff uh, and visit uh, a resident who, who'd suffered COVID and the work that our staff are doing with that gentleman in this instance, but doing this across the borough and he, he could not thank the staff that he'd done. This guy, within six hours of, of, of getting COVID, was rushed into hospital, was on a life support machine, lost every kind of function that he had and had to build back up. And, and it was, it was out rendering to see what we'd done, but it was also a reminder as how COVID had hit our communities and people like that. He was an healthy, 56-year-old guy who'd never had any illness, and it just shows what will happen to people going forward. We're actually taking a massive uh, pilot through to our bridge about bringing clinics and treatments uh, in a clinical setting into our communities. So physiotherapy, diabetic clinics, and so on. So there's lots of stuff that we're doing, linking with Keith teams with adults and, and Jenny's with children's and taking that health uh, le level forward and about how we work closely with our health colleagues. And that, and again, and with the leaders uh, leadership has brought us through this and then regular meetings we've had from the real dark days to how, how the pressure people was under. 159 members of staff who worked for IHL was immediately brought into the council and under the leader's direction, and they got an increase in their wages uh, because naturally they, we wanted people to be paid that living wage. So it was very, very important. Our leisure centres membership has gone up by 1,000. We have now 1,200,000 uh, members. The Learn to Swim, we've got 100,000 visits to our leisure centres and there's lots and lots happening there. And members have mentioned this in this chamber. We are really delighted when we announced that we were keeping and, and, and running low bank ground and in house. And I've got to say that the membership of that is increasing fourfold. But what I would is ask all members of this chamber who are on governing bodies or in connection with the schools to, to book those facilities. We're back up and running. They've been better than ever than they've ever been and we've got staff from Scotchman Flash working up there. So it's something that people need to kind of really promote in this chamber. I think the leader touched on the investment that we've done uh, at the hub uh, at Lee. So we've also got the investments at AOL and Pennington. We're going to invest 2.5 millions in Pennington, the CAF, the visitor centre, the toilets. This has been overdue for a long, long time at Pennington uh, and a 300,000 pound investment in the children's adventure play area there. We also invest in, and I think uh, Councillor Bullen will uh, not steal a thunder, will be saying more about this, two million pounds in the youth hub at Lee Sports Village. We've got the, Wigan, the Women's Euros and the Rugby League World Cup to come. 
There's really lots and lots of exciting things happening in this borough, all coming out of COVID when we've worked so really hard. The four million heritage lottery fund that we've put in for A is looking really positive. There's lots of work going on beside the scenes there with officers, and that's really looking good. That brings in the plantation gates, the bothy buildings, and all, all the infrastructure around the park, like the pond. So that will really make our visit a destination. 500,000 people a year visit A, and we're hoping that increases the fourfold. So the future is really, really, really encouraging. I want to just touch on briefly is our PR and events team. It's kind of one of those teams I always said that people, people only criticise PR teams when things are going wrong. They don't look at the day-to-day -day running of how the reputation management of this council moves forward. And, and we can see that the reputation of Wigan is paramount all over this country. And I know people, some people on opposition benches always point to a different things, but you see a different story when you see that reputation when you talk to people. The promotion that we put out daily on all the stuff that we do, whether it be our town stuff, the phosphorus and things like that, you know, the walk with the mile, the, the light festivals that we do. One of the things that we did do uh, in uh, 2019, uh, probably four weeks before the pandemic hit us, which none of us would have done, was set an events team up. And you might ask, why did we set an events team up? Because people have looked in this borough when events have gone on in the past, not really well coordinated, we didn't raise the revenue we should have raised from these events because we didn't have that structure. Health and safety issues, so we decided to do that. But one of the directions from the leader came that this had to pay its own way. And when we're doing events, that had to make money. So within that COVID period, and actually events collapsed, we didn't do it, but it gave that opportunity to John Eric and his team to kind of build them policies up and all the things that got were behind the scenes. We'll all look at having free events for our communities. We, what we want to do is make sure we get those big events which pay us so we can actually subsidise them, them smaller events in the communities to serve our communities and the members of this uh, chamber. So it's, it's with a great pleasure, really. Uh, I've got to kind of make three announcements in a way. One is this year we've got the Queen's Jubilee, which I know it's close to a lot of people's hearts, uh, and we're going to put a package of support in there. Uh, one is going to be actually across the borough, so we're going to be doing one at A, uh, one at Pennington Park and one at Mains Park. Uh, and we're going to put a package of things for communities, so road closures and there'll be party packs uh, to, to help all communities in that. So we'll be putting some messages out there where people can apply for that. But one thing I will remind people in this chamber, who've probably not been in as long as myself, the leader, and people like that, uh, when we brought Bratabura into this chamber in 1997, it was about funding elements like this. It's about you using your funding to support your communities, and this is an ideal opportunity to do that. So we're looking at June, so you've got your new allocation. Support your communities in Jubilee if it means that much to you. We will put some funding in there, but we'll be looking for you to do that as well. And I think as the leaders touched on, and also Councillor Raymond, we're going to put one, more, one million pounds into supporting across all these sectors over the next 12 months. It's really, really important that we kind of do that right, Look at how the, the demographics change because of COVID. And like we've always done in communities and across this chamber, we're not afraid to move direction when it's the right thing to do for our communities. Just because we might think it's the right thing to do now, it might not be the right thing to do in six months because it'll be a changing phase. But we will positively be supporting our communities in what will be some really, really rough times ahead. Make no bones about that. You can all see the price rises, as I mentioned in, at the start of my speech, and that's going to affect our communities fourfold. And really, we all want to be there. And I think as we've touched on with some tributes tonight to people, then people add the art of the community with what they want to do. We've got to carry on doing that, support our communities with that funding. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Edia. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to highlight some of the achievements of the last 12 months in children's services, if I may. And I would suggest to you that good use has been made of the investment that this council provided for children's services. And we continue to deliver on our vision for all of our young children, for our children and young people. We're very clear about our commitment to having the voice of young people at the heart of everything that we do. The advocacy offer for children in our care is better promoted 
and more children and young people are using the service. The Safeguarding Partnership is working with a group of pupils from a local primary school to understand what safeguarding means for children. The senior leadership team and myself have met with Youth Cabinet to get their ideas and thoughts on our COVID recovery pledge. Our Edge of Care offer has been reviewed. This will ensure that we work effectively with families to help them stay together by providing respite and intense support and working with them to solve problems. The sufficiency of residential placements is a challenge nationally and regionally and also for us here in Wigan. We continue to work incredibly hard to improve our in-house fostering service to combat these challenges. We've increased the payments to foster carers and improved our marketing campaign to recruit and retain. Short commercial break. If anyone knows of anyone who is interested in fostering, please get in touch with us because we really need you. Our Mockingbird team have won two national awards in the past year for their work in supporting our foster carers and young people. And a third team will further strengthen our offer to fostering families and that third team is, is ready to go. I believe our social care workforce is now designed to meet the demand for services in Wigan. However, that's a demand that continues to be very high because of a lot of the reasons that have been described by colleagues for our families. We've increased the number of social workers and teams with our innovative recruitment campaign. We've recruited over 50 social workers and 16 are currently on their way into us. We've improved our induction programme so staff feel welcome and well supported. And staff are telling us that they enjoy working in Wigan. We've strengthened our understanding of what it means to be a corporate parent to the children and young people in our care with awareness sessions for senior leaders and for elected members. And at this point, Madam Mayor, I would like to acknowledge the work of Councillor Carl Sweeney, lead member, for his sterling work as chair of the Corporate Parenting Board. In the education sector, our schools and settings remain in a position of strength. At December 2021, 91% of our schools and settings were good or outstanding. This is 100% in the nursery and special sector, 95% in primary and 63% in secondary. Through our support and challenge improvement work, we know that the majority of our academised secondary schools are confident that they are on a journey to good. And I can't leave without mentioning COVID, obviously. Again, our schools and settings remained open with minimal disruption to attendance. In fact, they did brilliantly, all of them. We know that in September, 98% of pupils returned to our schools. The holiday and activities and food programme, the HAP, is in place in 20 venues, delivering 15,000 activity sessions and feeding children where needed. During the pandemic, we provided IT equipment for vulnerable children and all those in our care. And we made sure that our schools were well supported in making the switch to remote learning. So looking ahead to the next 12 months, Madam Mayor, uh, if I can give you some highlights again. We are developing a participation strategy which will be taken to Corporate Parenting Board. This is key in order to develop how we consult with children, young people and their families. And linked to this, we had what I must say was a very lively session uh, last week in our elections for youth parliament here in this chamber. And I look forward to working with the new representatives to make sure we shape our services here in Wigan together, listening and acting on the voice of our young people. And also linked to this, as the leader mentioned, we're looking forward to our Lee Sports Village Hub soon being operational. 
with a range of facilities for young people. And this will be linked into local community provision, Pennington Park and Wigan and Lee College. Really something to celebrate. We will continue to embed the SEND and the education strategies improving our offer through detailed working plans and working with our Wigan family of schools to make sure that this work is having impact. We will also increase our local residential provision and continue to build relationships with high quality providers. We want to place a high number of children within the footprint of Wigan. This is positive for our young people as they can stay close to their known networks. And lastly, with reference to highlights, we will continue the improvements in children's social care, ensuring support is provided at the right time by the right person and in the right place. And finally, if I could, Madam Mayor, just say, the developments, progress and achievements over the last 12 months, I hope you are, agree, are impressive, particularly set against that backdrop of COVID. This is a testimony, not only to the hard work of the staff, but also to the corporate and political support that has been put in place. And I look forward to the year ahead with great enthusiasm and hope for our children, young people and families in our borough. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bullen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for allowing me to speak this evening. Listening to our residents has made it very clear to us that the environment and climate change were two of the most important issues to them. And that's why, Madam Mayor, over the past 12 months, we've invested over £8 million and committed a further £8 million to help clean up our local environment and help reduce our carbon footprint. Last year, we invested £1 million into the Our Town programme which saw 12 of our major town centres getting major facelifts, with areas getting deep, a deep clean, new litter bins, benches being installed, and new flower planters and more trees planted to help our In Bloom programme. Our town centres were decluttered and many lighting columns, columns were refurbished. The Our Town programme was very successful and also really well received and, re and supported by many of our local businesses and volunteers. To give you an understanding of the scale of the improvement works we carried out, here are just a few fa facts. A deep clean of 12 district shopping centres, including 10,000 square metres of jet washing and the installation of 176 litter bins. We also, we also engaged with over 1,000 local businesses. We carried out a targeted clean of up to 28 grot spots with 45 tonnes of litter and fly tipping removed, over 40,000 40, linear metres of lime markers were refreshed and we engaged with 94 volunteers with over 300 hours of litter picking. 24 miles of pavements were swept and 1,400 unnecessary items of street furniture were removed. And as part of the scheme, the delivery of the Art Town Live Events Programme was very successful with seven community fund days held. So given the success of the Our Town programme, we're now committing a further one million pounds to expand the programme into our remaining 12 district centres. And those centres are Astley Mosley Common, Adderley, Bryn, Henley Green, Lee East, Lee West, Shevington, Wigan Central, Wigan West, Worsley Mains, and of course, Winstanley. And again, we want to encourage footfall and support to high street businesses and foster local pride. And we are also committing to do additional sound town centre improvements works in both Wigan and Lee town centres. This commitment and investment demonstrates that we are listening to our residents and are committed to supporting the recovery of our district centres after the pandemic. 
We have also committed to renewing the Council's fleet of 290 vehicles at a cost of £7 million. Much of the new fleet is already operating across the borough, including a new fleet of bin wagons and new fleet of road sweepers, all helping to keep our streets cleaner and greener. Also included are a number of electric vehicles and we are looking to introduce more over the next 12 months. The new fleet is also much, uh, much greener, resulting in greatly reduced emissions, helping to reduce air pollution and our fleet's overall carbon footprint, which supports our climate change strategy. Our climate change strategy and carbon reduction goals are now a fundamental consideration of every single thing we do as a council. To underpin this, we are putting significant investment into reducing the council's and the borough's carbon footprint. We have now committed to spend a further £1 million on retrofitting our social housing stock. We are expanding our already successful programme of solar panel installation, helping to bring down our tenants' utility bills and helping to reduce the levels of fuel poverty that exist across our borough. I am also proud to say that we have been successful in securing additional funding of around £5.4 million to help reduce the carbon footprint of the public estate. This funding will support various carbon reduction initi initiatives, including Lee Turnpike Centre, where we are installing new solar panels and LED lights. We will be doing the same at Lee Leisure Centre, Lee Sports Village, Howbridge Leisure Centre, and our main operational depot at Make You Feel Way Inns. These schemes are currently at various stages of completion, with all scheduled to be completed by autumn of this year. Madam Mayor, this represents a major commitment and investment for the Council and will ultimately result in a significant reduction in annual carbon emissions for the Council. The creation of a new greener jobs is also a key priority for the Council and we start to, as we start to recover from the impacts of the pandemic. So to that end, we will further increase our current operational service apprenticeship scheme. We currently have 65 apprenticeships employed across our operational services, including building trades, gardeners, highways, and environmental enforcement. We are now looking to invest a further £350,000 in our apprenticeship scheme and to secure a further 20 new apprenticeships over the next 12 months. Further underlying our commitment to support our young people into employment and giving them a real term prospects, allowing them to look forward to a much brighter future. In total, Madam Mayor, the plans I have outlined represent an overall investment of some £16 million, ensuring our borough continues on its journey to a cleaner, greener and safer future and showing in real terms that climate change mitigation remains at the very heart of everything we do as a Labour Council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Prescott. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, as Port Holy holder for police, crime and civil contingencies, I want to reflect on some of the successes from the last year, but also highlight future challenges we as a Council, alongside our partners, will need to respond to in the coming year. From the perspective of the pandemic, I would like to commend the civil contingency response to this crisis. We have reacted and responded with speed to ensure that the resources we have across the Council have been deployed to best effect to support our communities. This has been a huge undertaking and I do not underestimate the ded dedication and resilience of our staff who have stepped up to this challenge. Whilst we may be coming out of the crisis, we know that we must now live with COVID and this will require us to plan what that looks like in practice and at the same time be ready should we see new variants or emergent issues we need to respond to. I'm confident that as a council and through our strong civil contingencies arrangements we will continue to protect our residents. In respect to my role on community safety, working with the Place and Community Safety Partnership this year, we've made good progress in tackling issues that impact the borough. From the recent Big Listening Festival, we know that one of the key priorities our residents is feeling is feeling safe and secure in the place where they live. 
and concerns about antisocial behaviour remain. ASB has been one of our core priorities this year. We successfully delivered Operation Bluefin, a multi-agency approach to tackling antisocial behaviour. We now have daily tasking meetings with Greater Manchester Police, have target hotspots and loca locations with multi-agency plans bringing together police, community resilience, targeted youth services, Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue, environment and enforcement officers. By ensuring we have teams on the ground working together and flexing our resources to tackle this problem, we are now seeing reductions in antisocial behaviour. And in the third quarter of this year, the community resilience team have seen a reduction of 33% reported problems of ASB. Antisocial behaviour will continue to be a core priority of the Place and Community Safety Partnership for 2022 and beyond, and we will continue to tackle it as a partnership. By working this way, we've also increased the visibility of our teams in local neighbourhoods and areas. We've worked closely with local ward members to identify local issues and build community capacity and engage people where they live and help them to find solutions. In areas such as Higher Foves, West Lee, the Poets Estate, Wigan Lee Town Centres, for example, we've been proactive multi-agency plans which we've been implementing. We have adopted an evidence-based approach to ensure we can make the biggest impact from our work. Where appropriate, we've invested CCTV provision using mobile cameras to support our joint operations with the police at different locations in the borough. We've also committed over £100,000 capital funding from the Camlet Fund for the installation of new CCTV cameras in Platbridge and Wigan Lee Town Centres. Touching on neighbourhoods, I'd like to highlight the impact of our new Chief Superintendent, Emily Hyam, for Wigan Division. She's reinvigorating the work of the Wigan Neighbourhood Policing Teams and ensuring that going forward they are visible and active in our communities, listening and engaging with residents. Her passion for making Wigan a safe place is clear and she's intent on improving service from Greater Manchester Police to our residents by getting back to the basics of good policing. We welcome this approach as a council. I look forward to working with Emily as she transforms the Wigan Division. Following a demand review, uh, demand review which I requested and supported by Emily, I'm pleased to advise that we'll be seeing an extra 98 police officers allocated to the Wigan Division over the next 18 months at a much needed time, funded by an increase in the policing precept. Through the Police and Community Safety Partnership, we've identified priorities to work on together as a borough. We have high levels of domestic abuse and as a council have new duties under the new domestic abuse bill we must deliver. The leader and Labour group have identified investment in domestic abuse services as a high priority. We are making inroads into this important work and have undertaken a joint strategic needs assessment of the borough. Co-designed a new domestic abuse strategy for the borough, which involved working with survivors to understand their lived experience. We've also introduced a new domestic abuse community service to work with low and medium risk victims in a proactive and targeted way. And a new domestic abuse helpline has been introduced. I would like to thank the council's Mead and comms team on the impact of the communications campaign, Love is Not Abuse, which has seen an, an increase in reporting from victims. We will be investing £717,000 in the next financial year to continue our work to deliver the strategy. This includes funding our independent domestic abuse advisor service, a contribution to our community domestic abuse contract, and investment to increase or look at innovative approaches to providing safe accommodation and ways to help keep survivors safe in their own homes in the future. I would at this point like to thank my lead member for domestic abuse, Councillor Paula Wakefield, for her hard work and support. We've also invested £50,000 in target hardening to support victims of domestic abuse and those most vulnerable to crime in making their properties safer and more secure against crime. We will look, after, sorry, we will look at wider gender-based violence and as a borough, I've signed up to the new GEM gender-based violence strategy with the other nine GM local authorities who will play an active part in addressing this important issue. We have been successful in a bid for Home Office investment of £284,000 to improve the safety of women in our nighttime economy, implement best practice and learning based on what has worked well elsewhere. This will assist us in our ambition to get purple flag status for Wigan and Lee Town Centres, where we have introduced nighttime safety marshals on a Friday and Saturday night. Purple flag status is awarded to towns and cities that can demonstrate excellence in managing the evening and nighttime economy which are diverse, vibrant, safe and attractive and welcoming. This Labour-run council is working hard to ensure our towns meet the strict criteria and will be submitting a bid for Wigan Lee Town Centre 
picked up the Wigan Town Centre in June 2022, with submission for late at a later date. Another key focus is reducing violence and serious crime. We've seen nationally and across GM and in Wigan that violence and serious crime is increasing, whether this is violence against women, knife and gun crime or organised crime. We need to have clear plans and strategies in place to reduce and prevent this type of crime in the future. This involves us tackling the crime directly, but also doing prevention work with young people through schools, targeted youth services and with our voluntary sector partners to educate young people on the perils of getting drawn into this type of crime. This year we piloted a new approach through the Community Safety Resilience Team to target young people on the edge of criminal activity, to work with them and their families to help them find an alternative route to take. And I'm pleased to say we are having an impact already. We've also invested £100,000 in voluntary sector community safety projects, over 40 projects running across the borough. We're working with the new Wigan Probation Service to look at how we manage offenders in the borough and develop effective perpetrator programmes to help individuals to turn their lives around and prevent re-offending in the future. All these priorities and areas of work are important to ensure that our residents and communities can feel safe and live a life which is not impacted on by adverse effects of crime. For us, this also means continuing support to support community cohesion and ensuring that Labour run Wigan is a place where all nationalities and cultures can live safely together and we celebrate the strengths of our diverse communities. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And uh, can I just start by saying it's been my privilege to have worked with some absolutely incredible officers over the last 12 months, maybe not quite 12 months, but also to have the support of the Housing Advisory Panel as well, whose enthusiasm and insight have been invaluable. So thank you to everybody that I've been working with over the last uh, few months. Uh, well, for me, social housing and welfare support is the cornerstone of any council, or should be. And as I, I don't think you'll not, not be surprised to know that uh, the demand for this has increased year on year. And uh, sadly, we have actually lost quite a lot of our properties, for example, under the right to buy when it was the Tory government, uh, the Thatcher government in the 80s. Since then, we've actually lost 12,000 properties uh, of affordable homes. Uh, that's a third of our stock. And I think as what's been alluded to earlier is that we've actually got some issues from our waiting list perspective. So we have some real, real problems that we actually try and have to address. And um, as a council, we understand the importance of the uh, good quality affordable homes. And we're needing to explore property, uh, opportunities and projects to help provide these uh, throughout the borough. So we've had to be creative in, in some of the ways that we've done that uh, in order to provide some affordable rented accommodation. Uh, despite the obstacles, and, and there's been a lack of meaningful financial support uh, for housing development from government up to date, but, re but recently we've actually been able to provide uh, an extra care unit, 20 units in Bevington Street in Ashton in Makerfield, and then we've recently done Bracknell Court, 17 new family homes in Goose Green. And one of the things that we want to do, which is again has been mentioned tonight, is that we're wanting to create, develop and build affordable new homes, of which there's over 700 uh, that we're, we're proposing in the, in the near, well, in the next few months, in the next, next few years, sorry. So we're going to be uh, continuing the, the, with the successes of the new build, and uh, we're going to embark on an ambitious and really exciting program of build. Uh, and this is how we are needing to do it. We're going to be creative on our smaller pieces of lands uh, by earmarking over 100 million towards uh, affordable ho the house building of the affordable homes. But, but, but not only that, we need to actually match that money so we're actually getting the uh, getting a, a wider pot of money to actually help us build those properties uh, and we're going to be working with local building companies together to create jobs and apprenticeships which again is something that we feel is in extremely important in this part of our streaming of the community wealth building. We've already maximised some of that funding already. Uh, we've actually been given in the New Steps programme, it was over, an, over a million allocation for 12 homes for helping people who had uh, experienced homelessness. And we're hoping that we're going to get another tranche of money for that as well. So that's something that's an ongoing thing. 
And we're also we, we accelerated our partnership working with other social housing providers, the housing associations that we have in our boroughs to encourage... Councillor Gambles, excuse me a minute. Sorry. Can you please be quiet while our cabinet members are giving the presentations? I would really like to listen to these. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gambles. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, <coughs> Right, thank you. So we've accelerated our partnership programme working with other social housing providers and encouraging them to increase their investment in the borough uh, and further grow the numbers of the quality affordable homes that we have. So we're being proactive, we're working closely with other colleagues as well which, uh, uh, and the reputation that we're getting as a borough is, is actually helping that for people wanting to come in and, and work in this particular area. I think uh, the difficulty we've got is that on our waiting list, there's a, a high proportion of people who need one and two bedroom properties. We don't have them in our stock. Our, our stock tends to, it's very limited. Our stock tends to be family homes. Uh, and uh, that's actually in contrast to our southern counterparts. And I think really with, with the introduction of the bedroom tax, they weren't really taking account of that in the north. So the north has actually got a lot of... Pro, uh, of uh, family homes, so that has caused us an issue from a, from a bedroom tax perspective as well, which we have raised at, uh, at, at government level at, uh, the, with the Bacon Report and everything else that we needed to review that. And, uh, but what we're trying to do is, is we've, we did actually launch an acquisition programme where we bought a number of properties so that smaller units that could, and also that could be adapted for uh, people who've got some disabilities in order to try and meet some of that demand. We're never going to meet the full demand, but we were trying to make, do innovative ways and explore different opportunities to see how we can actually increase our stock and provide that, uh, that affordable home for our local people. We're actually working with the, the uh, private sector, extending the opportunity uh, through our ethical lettings agency so there's private landlords who are offering us properties at affordable rents, longer term. So it's, it's extending the opportunity for people on the waiting list and looking at it in different parts of the borough that are not necessarily traditionally in the, uh, the housing estates. So it's actually widening the choice for local people. You may know it's the Empty Homes Week this week and uh, we've been very proactive on our own empty homes uh, and we're also encouraging uh, our privately owned uh, empty homes as well. And uh, uh, recently, the Empty Homes team has brought over about 100 homes back into use. Uh, there's a, a press release that's, go, that's gone out today uh, that it's, it's mentioning about a family in Australia who weren't aware that they actually had a property in, this, in, in the locality in the borough. And we've been able to bring that back into use as well through some of the uh, investigation that's gone on. So again, we'll look, the, the, the teams are creatively looking at different ways to actually where we can actually extend our housing uh, offer. And uh, the thing is, we also recognise that uh, the aspirations to buy our properties, uh, so, so the aspirations for some people to buy the properties, that's great. And what we've also tried to do is make, uh, help them with that so they've got equi equity loans so they can support them into home ownership. So we, I think it's to date 35 households has taken us up on that and there may be more to come as, as well. We're investigating self-builds so that people have the opportunity to do that, but also shared ownership. So there's a, a, a li mixture of uh, home tenure that we're looking at in order to, to try and give people an opportunity and options to, to get a home. It's very important to us that our tenants uh, have got a very well-maintained, affordable home that's comfortable. And uh, one of the things is within our estates, we are... Uh, wanting to work with our tenants to reinvigorate our tenants' engagement strategy, which is something that we are definitely going to co-create with our tenants and residents uh, on the estates so that we're working with them. We're, 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 it's very uh, embryonic at the moment, but we, we're needing to actually engage with uh, our, our tenants and residents. We have done so on a number with The Voice. I've actually been to a recent meeting, very enthusiastic in order to, wanting to try and make sure that they're involved in that and that's something we will be working on more, more uh, in the next few months. And we're also, in order to do that, I mean, for me, uh, the word of mouth, having a conversation is the most powerful and we're enhancing our workforce teams and our estate teams so that we can have those conversations, that we can actually uh, get, build those relationships, that we are visible that we're actually speaking to people, having the meaningful conversations, exploring the ideas that they have, 
getting to know the people on the estate so that they know what kind of support we can offer as a council. Because with the welfare team and with the actual increase in bills and uh, there's, there's issues with, um, with people affording and there's a lot of worried people out there. We have an, an excellent welfare team who actually supports these, uh, these people across the borough. And it's actually trying to make sure that people are aware of what's available to them. We can get that out to people, word of mouth, on the streets, having those conversations because of what we're trying to do in, within, within our teams. We've already been told, loud and clear, with the conversations that we've already had, that uh, young people need to have more to do. That our estates, that the appearance of the estates needs to be improved. That there's concerns about antisocial behaviour. We are going to be working with those residents to actually address those issues through the housing advisory revenue account. There are things that we will be doing and working with, but we will be doing it through the tenants and residents and what they tell us, how we can get in involved and engaged so that we're working in partnership, in true partnership, ensuring that the residents are co-creating and co-designing these initiatives for the borough. Now, the investment in our properties continue and uh, it's a priority. It's making sure that we're future-proofing our homes, that, that, that uh, particularly as we've got expecting the, fuel, the rising of fuel bills, um, my colleagues have mentioned in respect of the green agenda, we're looking at that to make sure that the homes are, uh, as I said, future-proofed. And the, uh, we're making sure that we are giving uh, advice and, and welfare support to a number of our residents. Our repair service, I think a number of, uh, house, of uh, households received a letter to explain why there was uh, a backlog. As a result of that, there's been more resources that's been placed in that. The hours, uh, the hours of work have extended. The actual times of work has extended and it's trying to make sure that we're, we're, we're making uh, headway with that which is something we are which is it's, it's, it's tailing that down but key to all of these proposals and I've only touched on quite a, a, a few things I think that the highlights are the tenants engagement strategy the involvement in the estates the fact that we are going to be resourcing it both in people and financially uh, to work with our residents but it's also, it's making sure that the, the key to all of this is having a strong, open and honest relationship with our tenants and with our residents, working together in true partnership where there's mutual respect and where every voice is important and really does matter. And I think the people in this room and the people, that, the contacts that you have will be extremely uh, invaluable to taking that work forward. So I look forward to working not only with the excellent teams that we have in the council and the housing advisory panel, but I look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gambles. Deputy Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, clearly, adult social care has been under tremendous pressure, certainly over the last two years during the pandemic. Um, and it's also been under pressure for the last 10, 12 years with austerity um, uh, taking a significant amount of council spend to address. And uh, uh, Councillor Raymond indicated that, you know, social care, adult social care needed about three million, over three million pound a year spending on it, purely to deal with demand in the system caused by you know, an ageing population and, and actually the real pressure on adult social care budgets is for adults of working age. And so generally, you know, and people will know from national press and, uh, um, and details that have come out over TV of the pressures in social care, which, uh, I mean, Boris Johnson said he was going to solve the problem of social care. So we're getting a national insurance rise later this year. But there's very little to nothing coming to social care. And there's an intention that local authorities will raise council tax to meet that, which is why we're levying that 1%, which we're allowed to, to levy. But you have to bear in mind that that brings us about 1.1 million when your demands on the system are over 3 million. And bearing in mind that 
because of the low council tax base here, because 85, about 85% 85 of our houses in band A, B, C, or D, compared to some of the southern county councils that have very expensive houses in band F, G, and H. So 1% raises very little here. And yet the demand is probably greater here because more people are, uh, have to have their care paid for by this council when you know, property values in the south are extremely high and so people can be self-funders much <coughs> more easily. Um, and the things that the government's addressing are not really helping us in social care. It's like it's coming tomorrow, in three years' time, when the NHS has had all the money, social care will get it all. Let's wait and see whether we actually do. So we've had the pandemic, which has added additional pressure onto us. Um, working with our health partners, obviously we know that hospitals have been uh, really struggling to meet the demand on the hospital beds and people coming out. And so work on ho our hospital discharge teams has been really important in one, ensuring that there can be that flow through out of the hospital, but ensuring that home first is the option for people to go back home and not end up in residential care. Because, of course, during the pandemic, according to the National Audit Office, 25,000 people were admitted to care homes without being tested for COVID. And that resulted in what we saw during the first wave in a number of deaths in, in care homes. So actually getting people home was much better. So nationally, there is a big issue with social care and adult social care and the funding of social care. And Wigan's no exception from that. And, and so a lot of things are relative. So how have Wigan done over the last year? So one of the things uh, we've done, and, and Councillor Gamble uh, spoke about that in, in, her, uh, in, in her address, is the view that keeping people at home, maintaining independence, enabling people to live a full life without because I don't think anybody actually says, when I get older, I want to live in residential care in a care home. So the opportunity to provide people with that ability to stay at home, to maintain their independence for as long as possible, is really important. And so some of the things we've done over the last few years, and certainly last year, uh, when the pressure was on in terms of the hospital floors, is develop reablement services. <coughs> Four staff in 2008, 82 staff in 2021. That is around enabling people to develop that independence to stay at home. CQC have inspected it twice. First, outstanding. And secondly, when they did a reassessment, it returned outstanding. It was the first, well, it, it might have been the second, but I think it was the first uh, reablement service in the country to return an outstanding service. And I think it was about the second in the country to actually get a service in the first place. Some of the other things we've done is have a fairly ambitious housing with care program and supported living program. <coughs> And so what we've seen around the borough are things like Tamfield and Mayfield and Marigold Lodge and Hindle Lodge. And we see for older people, housing with extra care in Little Lane, in 29 Bevington Street, and currently under construction in Lee, Wardsdale, that enables older people to live independently, with support for much longer. So 
the Tam Fields, the May Fields, the Hindle Lodge, the Marigold Lodge that provide accommodation for people with learning disability, people with autism, have seen people's lives improve significantly in terms of the amount of independence and connection with community that they've managed to maintain and the opportunities that are available to them to mix within community and a normal type of life. And that move from residential care into more independent, semi-independent living with support has not only just seen people's lives improve, but has actually been at reduced cost to us. And so that is something that we will continue to pursue and develop. So like I say, not everybody says they want to live in a care home. I'm very serious, anybody I'll have thought when they get older. And in 2015, the number of care homes in this borough, bearing in mind that this council only has one care home for the elderly, the other 51 are private, 2015, 55% of the homes in this borough were related, were uh, CQCs, rated them as good or outstanding. We didn't think that was good enough. And so we've worked tirelessly with our quality assurance team and our, the team that look at care homes and working in a more collaborative way with them. The one, the one that we own, the one that the council runs, is um, rated outstanding by CQC. But I can tell you that in February 2022, the number of care homes in this borough, because of the council officers, because of the quality assurance, working with the homes in a collaborative way, developing, improving quality, 91.8% of the care homes in this borough are now good or outstanding. That's, that's the highest in the Northwest. And some authorities are still looking at 55 and 60%. We're on 90, nearly 92%, one of the best in the country. So despite all the challenges we've had, we've managed to raise standards there. There are about 34,000 carers in this borough. Many of them, uh, and a number of them, are employed by this authority. And so we've been working to look at carers, people who work for this authority but have caring responsibilities. And don't forget, that's not one group of people because today you could have a caring responsibility that you've had for several years and due to unfortunate, due to debt or whatever, you're no longer a carer. And there are people working who might not be carers but might wake up tomorrow morning and find out they are a carer. So it's not one group of people. So this council has been awarded a level two carer confidence award by Carers UK for the approach and the work we're doing to support carers. Now, there are only three councils in the country that have got that award, and we're the only one in the Northwest. So there's a number of achievements we've made. This year, this last year, our mental health services transferred to another provider, to the Greater Manchester Mental Health Trust. And part of that transfer was to develop with the new provider, uh, North West Burroughs was a provider before, but that was taken over by Mersey Care, which is why we went to Greater Manchester Mental Health Trust, being a Greater Manchester authority, being the most appropriate thing to do. But actually the service specification that we uh, did, working in partnership with GMMH, working with GPs, working with all the services uh, across the borough, the NHS, GPs, voluntary sector, drew up a service specification 
It was called Transfer and Transform. And so we started to transform mental health services. And that's very much needed because we need to focus on prevention and early intervention. And particularly after COVID, we know that the mental health issues that exist within the community have increased significantly. Certainly in children's mental health, but actually in mental health of adults as well. We've also got the additional problem of long COVID following the, um, the pandemic. And the, the consequences of long COVID are going to be quite demanding on some of our services. So actually continuing that transformation of mental health services is really important. Several years ago, we developed an ethical framework for home care. One of the things about that was that we were able to rule out 15 minute visits. We were able to ensure staff got paid travel time. And actually, we actually created a situation where some of the bigger providers uh, exited the borough and to home care was commissioned from a larger number of small, independent, locally based family run firms. That gave us a great opportunity because it actually changed the culture of home care, which was a very competitive market with companies being very competitive. But what we created was one of a collaborative approach. And during the pandemic, Many authorities had a waiting list for home care because of the demands on home care with people coming out of hospital and the fact that the staff were either isolating with COVID or, or self-isolating because a member of the family had COVID. So because of staffing difficulties and increased demand from people coming out of hospital, many authorities had waiting lists for home care. With our, re our reablement service and our home care service operated right through the pandemic, providing a full service. And this authority never had a waiting list for home care. Or reablement. It was stretched at times, but we managed to do that successfully. And so, whilst we face these difficulties, actually our performance is far better than many other areas in this country. And that's been recognised. It was recognised at an awards ceremony last year, where this council received Council of the Year, and that was specifically because of our response to the pandemic. Because I know from providers that operate nationally, from the NHS, from other councils, from the LGA, and even from government, that the response in Wigan was unique in dealing with the pandemic. And so it's just a matter of relativity. Yes, we were stretched, we struggled. It's difficult to, uh, to cope at times, but we managed. And we manage on a balanced budget. One of the very few councils in the country that have a balanced budget in adult social care. And so we've managed to do that. Now in the coming year, we're gonna face a number of challenges. Because two years into a pandemic, the government have decided to fundamentally bring out a big restructure of health and social care. So the clinical commissioning group, the Wigan clinical commissioning group that we as a council have worked in partnership with, within the Healthier Wigan partnership, and develop that partnership working within our localities to provide services more locally within localities in an integrated way 
the CCG will be abolished on the 1st of July. Well, the 30th of June. On the 1st of July, as with every other CCG in Greater Manchester, health and social care integration will be, uh, well, the social care will still come under the local authority, but there'll be an integra integrated care board for the whole of Greater Manchester. So fundamental, deep, uh, structural change in the health and care system towards the end of a pandemic that's created increased demands. There's less a huge backlog of elective care, which brings demands on our social care in terms of providing uh, support for people at home who are waiting their operation or coming out from with increased demand on mental health services, with increased demand on social care services, you know, it's probably not the right time to do that. But we'll manage, we'll manage. We will work collaboratively and in partnership on a locality basis in the same way that we've been doing over the years. Of course, we face additional costs so I doubt whether it's actually the three million that we need, it's probably more. Because don't forget, there's a 1.75% national insurance increase coming. Now that affects us, but it also affects all those providers that provide commission services or services that we have to pay for. So what we have is care homes who we pay, have to pay fees and services for, have got 1.75% increased national insurance pay for their staff. They've got energy costs which are rocketing and we got inflation is currently 5% and likely to be 6 or 7%. Even having done that and with the difficulties we face and ensuring that we maintain a balanced budget, we will be giving all our care providers uh, a fee rise of 6.2% this year to meet with all the demands. But that is, a, that is a cost on us as a council. So there's plenty of opportunities to move forward because we will do that within a balanced budget and that is clearly what Councillor Raymond set out and what we'll do. It's a period of tremendous uncertainty because there's no clarity. I don't even think that the health and care bill has been approved by uh, government yet. So we're not even sure just exactly what and how it will work. So that uncertainty and that challenge is a real issue. But we'll get through it, and let's like say, over the last few years, the relationships and the partnerships we have built with the NHS, with primary care, with the council, with all the organisations that operate in this borough has been tremendous, and that will continue and carry us through. One of the big things during the pandemic was the fact that staff in social care, and don't forget this council, within a week or two of the first lockdown, sourced PPE and supplied all our care services with PPE when the government was failing to do that to ensure that care workers in Wigan had adequate protection. We created the facility at the Mercure to deal with homelessness and those issues then. And we'll continue to do everything that's right. But all those care workers, many of whom are on national living wage, are low paid, quite a number on zero hours contracts. And what I'm formally committing this council to achieve is that every worker in this borough who works in social care will receive the foundation living wage as soon as possible. Now clearly, with all the challenges and uncertainty that face us this year, and financial challenge, 
probably not possible to do it in April because there's a lot of discussion that needs to be had. We need to talk to social care providers. We need to ensure that if we up the fees to enable them to pay foundation living wage, that they actually pay it. And how much that would cost us. So actually there's a, there's a program to go through for the next 12, 12 months or so to sort out the cost, the arrangements with care providers, uh, how we're going to fund it to ensure that we fund it in as financially sustainable ways. And I know a number of authorities are also committing to this and in fact even doing it sooner. I question that because some of these authorities are actually using huge amounts of reserves to prop up the social care services. So whilst I'm committing us to do it, we will do it in a financially responsible way. We will negotiate it with care providers. We will ensure it is paid. And I am fairly confident by this time next year, we'll be announcing the fact that every care worker in this borough will get foundation living wage. And that's a commitment for now and ongoing. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Conley. Councillor Briley, have you got a point of order you wish to raise? It's ten past eight now. Are we, are we taking it till nine o'clock or are we taking it further? Because it seems to be dragging on this. There's three more cabinet members. Are they going to speak? I'm sorry, Councillor Briley. I wouldn't call it dragging on. I think they're very important reports that we'd like to listen to. But as you do know, for the budget meeting, there isn't a time set for each cabinet member to speak. So we are nearly at an end. I'm sorry if it's getting you down a bit, but can you just persevere just a little bit longer if you don't mind? Your residents need to hear all this information as a ward councillor, as mine do. So I'm very interested to listen to it. So we're nearly at an end now, Councillor Breeler. Thank you. Down, it's just dragging on. You know, they should have a minimum time. We're, we're all here as councillors. We all want to get on with the budget. We all want to listen to figures. But that then was like 40 minutes of whatever. Well, as sorry, I said, Madam we're nearly there now. Thank you, Councillor Breeley. Are these recommendations seconded? Happy to second, Madam Mayor. Councillor Raymond, would you like to speak now or reserve your right to speak until later in the debate? Thank you. Amendment 1. We have received an amendment to the Leader's motion prior to the deadline yesterday from Councillor Breeley, which has been seconded by Councillor Gerard. Mr. McEvitt, is this a balanced budget? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, this doesn't uh, give us a balanced budget if we vote on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. McEvitt. As this amendment does not lead to a balanced budget, we will now move to the second amendment. We have received a second amendment to the leader's motion prior to the deadline yesterday from Councillor Gerard, which has been seconded by Councillor Hodgkinson. Mr. McEvitt, is this a balanced budget? Yes, Madam Mayor, this gives us a balanced budget if we accept this amendment. Thank you. Councillor Gerard, would you like to introduce your amendment, please? You may now speak for five minutes. Yes, Councillor Breeley? Uh, the, more, the amendment I put in there, he said it's, it's not leading to a balanced budget. I think you best go back to school. It's the money what's already in the account, which balances the budgets up. It's not extra money we're asking for, it's already in reserves. I think it's a bit harassment that, I mean, a bit, bit insulting towards an elected councillor. I've run my own business for 30 years. I know what I'm doing. Councillor Briley, shall we ask Mr McEvitt to actually come in and explain why it's not a balanced budget? Oh yeah, I welcome that. Yeah. I welcome that. Thank and you. we can explain where all the money goes. Mr we McEvitt, can you explain to Councillor Breeley why his amendment doesn't lead to a yes, balanced budget? Yes, certainly, please? Madam Mayor. Thank you. So the amendment suggests using loans given to local authorities to fund the amendment. Um, as it says 
in the amendment, these are loans to local authorities and they're all repaid. So they're not part of the budget. What they are part of is the treasury management policy. So this is a, an item that's being considered tonight, but it's purely around cash flow. So this is how the council funds all its services. So if you voted on that amendment, you would be taking 25 million pounds out of services that are covered by the budget. So that's why it doesn't give a balanced budget, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. McKevitt. Sorry, Councillor Breeley, we'll go listen to Councillor Gerrard's amendment now. You've had your explanation. But Mr. McKevitt has given your explanation. If you're not happy with that, can you meet up with him outside of this meeting and he'll go through it again with you? Right. Can we move on now to Councillor Gerrard's amendment, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Paul, for confirming this is a balanced amendment. Uh, my first one, I, I'm hoping you can take them all as individual amendments rather than just all carte blanche. The first one is for a Netherton Park Life Leisure Facility. The wording is, I propose that subject to a business case, confirming that there is no impact on the revenue budget to set aside two million pound from the capital programme. This could be found through a mixture of carrying forward underspends on various capital programme schemes and the use of some reserves. Now, it's been touched on by quite a few of the cabinet members today, how important it is to actually engage with the, the youth of our, of our communities. Uh, as you know, we had a part life scheme in Wigan, in Wigan Council, but the two part life hubs are very close to one another. There's nothing really on the east side of the, the borough. And as you know, Atherton is quite, it has its issues, don't it? You know, like, like every other, other town, to engage with the youth. But if, if we can engage, get a business case with the part life, with the FA, we could actually use some, some land there in Atherton to bring a facility what, which is much needed. So this isn't really just committing money out of the budget, it's just get have the business case there to see if it's viable. So I'm hoping that can be, uh, can be voted on. The second one, as you know, we've got the Queen's Jubilee celebration. And uh, I know Chris has uh, mentioned some kind of funding, which was announced 24 hours after we submitted our amendment. So <laughs> thanks, Chris. But the original proposal was uh, that 250k, 250,000 is used from the reserves to fund a very wide celebration of the Queen's Jubilee. This can be divided equally per ward to help town centres and neighbours to commemorate this achievement. Now, our original thinking behind this was that we can have uh, in town centres street parties, basically, where it not just bring people together, it will actually benefit businesses in the town centre or in the neighbourhood, where it's near shops and what have you. But we'd also like to think that very generations to come, I don't think anybody's going to see another person for 70 years on the throne. And I think we should welcome that by, by commemorating in certain wards with either, not just parties, but some kind of monuments or plaques or, you know, in the area and, and properly commemorate it. The second one is the 20 million development budget. And I know uh, Councillor Winston has got issues over this. But uh, I propose not to get rid of the, uh, the plans or, you know, scrap it, but just to halt the plans of the M58 link road. For twen since 2017, the council have sat on 25 million pounds just for this, this budget. That money, I think, could be put to better use. You know, we, we are, want to encourage, basically, what Councillor Gamble said about house building. Now, very welcome, the £100 million for 770 houses. But you did mention that we've got a demand for one or two bedroom abodes, be it flats or bungalows or what have you. And I think that money there 
that twenty million could be put to better use. On onto that, as well as the family homes. And the fourth one, uh, I've gone through all the fine sections, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite uh, happy to be proved wrong. But I can't see anything where we, we've been not adopted the uh, Environmental Protection Act, Section Four of it, Section Seventy Nine, uh, Ninety Nine, Schedule Four. Sorry, where we can actually charge back the the return of trolleys and baskets to uh, supermarkets. But now I've contacted officers before in the past. It's not really been a problem, but... Councillor Gerard, you've only got 30 seconds left. That's all I mean. Back. It's becoming a problem. <laughs> and uh, do I get 10 seconds there? It's becoming a problem. And I think by bringing this charge in, it would encourage supermarkets to actually put systems in place so these trolleys just can't be found in council estate, Riverside, Paris, everywhere. So I'm hoping you can uh, approve that. Thank you. Thank you. Is the amendment seconded? Seconded, Madam Mayor. Councillor Hodgkinson, as a seconder, would you like to speak on the amendment? Um, five minutes? No, it's okay. I think Councillor Gerard's covered everything. Okay, thank you. Leader, do you accept the amendment to your motion? Uh, actually not, Madam Mayor, but I'm quite happy to respond to Councillor Gerard. You have five minutes, Leader. Thank you very thank much, you. Madam Mayor. And thank you, thank you Councillor Gerard, for bringing your amendment forward tonight. But unfortunately, I, I can't accept it. Uh, firstly, on, on part life, actually, it's the Football Foundation Trust Hubs, I think, now. Uh, and, and actually, they control that. I, I think it's took us five years to deliver what we've already got. So, really not in our gift, and I don't think there's any need to allocate £2 million towards a, a foundation trust, not just in Atherton, but across the borough. So, I think, I think that's one of the reasons I can't accept it. It's not in our gift. It's in the Football Foundation, and certainly if they come forward uh, asking us for more proposals, we will certainly respond, but I certainly don't need to put anything in the budget this year to actually cover that. Can I just refer again, and I think you touched on it, uh, up to the Queen's Jubilee, uh, Platinum Jubilee, and, and it is a magnificent uh, achievement in terms of what uh, Her Majesty has, has, has done, and we intend to support that, and I think Chris made it very, very clear the, the amount of support we will give. And I think it's also important, and I know you do, but we need to make sure that if there's schemes going on in your borough, in your, your ward, that you support them through your brighter borough. That's what it's there for. That's why we gave an increase last year, and you'll get your new allocation in May this year. Now, not to accept the wrath of Councillor Winston Lee, but we're certainly not going to slow down on the M58. I think it was probably first suggested by Lancashire County Council sometime in the early 50s, and we're closer now than we've ever been. So they're certainly not going to pull back on the M58, and I'm sure my colleagues from Winston Lee and all around the borough will be saying, there's no way you're doing that, and if you do it, that you're paralyzed. So, so that one's uh, not, uh, not, not for, for acceptance. And on the last one, Stuart, we will get uh, Paul Barton to, to speak to you on that. We don't need it in the budget. We can sort it out and he'll speak to you direct and explain the procedure that we'll put in place to deal with it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Leader. I will now move to the vote on Councillor Gerard's amendment and remind members to please use the electronic voting system as a recorded vote must be taken for this item. Members, please vote now. The amendment is lost. Amendment three. We have received a third amendment to the leader's motion prior to the deadline yesterday from Councillor Wynne Stanley, which has been seconded by Councillor Marsh. Mr McEvitt, is this a balanced budget? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, if you accepted the amendment from Councillor Wynne Stanley, it would lead to a balanced budget. Thank you. 
Councillor Winstanley, could you would introduce your amendment, please? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, hopefully it's been worth the wait. Um, <laughs> no doubt Labour benches won't think it is, but never mind, I'm going to play on regardless. Um, Madam Mayor, um, thank you for uh, allowing my amendment. Um, it's in two parts. The first bit um, uh, relates to our town. So, yes, I'm pleased that there has been an announcement tonight about our town and that investment. However, I do think having had the experience of the Our Town last year, it made, we're welcome for the investment, however, I think it made minimal impact. Um, and certainly that's the feedback that I've had from my colleagues and, uh, and a number of residents. So what I would like to do is the remaining bit of the budget that's in there for this year, if that could be spent in those wards that benefited in this year, um, you leave your programme for next year because you've already talked about that earlier on, but let's use that money that's in the pot to go back to those communities that did benefit in this financial year and let's see where we can split that money between those communities and work with community groups to see if we can get much more um, investment and let's make those areas looking a lot better. So what I want to do is really build on what we had. I think the problem was it, was it was spread far too thinly to have much of an impact. So that is my, that's my proposal regarding our town. Now, my second bit is probably the more controversial bit, and that relates to the uh, Wigan Town Centre and, the, uh, and the, really the state of the town centre and the plight that our Wigan market traders face at this moment in time. And I, don't, and I believe that if we don't do something radical now, these market traders will not last six months, never mind two years, uh, before they have to move into the new, um, the new development. So it's really important that we do something. If we don't, they won't survive. We've already seen footfall down by a quarter since pre-pandemic. We're now moving into, this is going to look like a building site. Um, we're already, obviously, We've, we've had the reports on the galleries car park closing. That's had another impact, and I know there were reasons for that. However, that has also led to other problems with market traders and facing that antisocial behaviour, and we need to crack down on that. I'm sure Councillor Anderson has got that on his agenda to make sure that we do that. But the current state of Wigan Market is an absolute embarrassment, and when we have Holton Borough Council taking out a full-page advertisement in the Wigan Observer to say, come and shop at Widnes Market. If you're a trader, come and trade here. I think as a market town, that is absolutely a damning indictment of where we are today. You may not want to vote for this uh, amendment, but please, if you don't vote for this, you've got to do something radical. If you don't put any support in, and what I'm asking for is 75% reduction from now until they move into the new development, and that offer should be open for all new people as well. I want to see Wigan Market buzzing. Let's get people coming in. Why can't we have our advertisements? We've told we've got a world-class PR team. Let's, let's promote Wigan. We shouldn't be relying on market traders putting up their own signs, we're still open. It's not good enough. We, we need to do something radical and we need to do something now. If you don't do something now, it'll be finished and there'll be no traders and that'll be the end of it. So please support this amendment. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Winstanley. Is the amendment seconded? Happy to second, Madam Mayor. Councillor Marsh has seconded. Would you like to speak on the amendment? I would just add that, you know, Councillor Wynne Stanley's covered most of the points, but just to say, once the market traders are gone, it'll be really damn like, hard to get them back. So thanks, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Leader, do you accept the amendment to your motion? No, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Five minutes to let us know why you don't accept the amendment. Thank you. Well, that's quite easy, Madam Mayor. Uh, can, can I just first of all touch on our town? Because our town actually, I think, has been a success. And actually, I do remember your picture in Oral saying how great it was in our town. So I know that Michael really deep down really appreciated what we did. And I think it's only fair that we now go into the centres who missed out. I think it's more important now than ever that we make a commitment to those centres. And it's not just the 12 centres, it's the town centre as well, both in Wigan and Lee. So this is a big commitment that we are doing. 
Speaking of the market traders, and please, please, please don't misuse your trust that they have in you. Because tonight, I think you've done that in some, some way. Let us be honest, this is public money. This is public money we are talking about. You know, because you've been involved in the discussions, what we've asked the market traders for. You know that without going through that with a fine tooth comb, we could not commit any further funding. Because it's not just about the funding, it's also about the support we want to give the market traders. And the market traders are an important part of the town centre, and I have always acknowledged that. And I might even put an advertisement in the Holton Borough Times if that's what we need to do. But at the same time, please, you understand and your government understands, you just don't give public money away without actually going through the details and people actually responding to what we've asked for. And in fact, market traders have come forward with what we've already asked for. There's a numbers of market traders have already approached us, wanting to work with us and wanting to go through the process that we've outlined. We also want to put in there additional business support for market traders to, to, to speak to experienced business promoters and that's what we want to do. Because it is important that it is a success. But at the same time, as you know, we've got to be accountable for public funds. I'm quite happy to meet with you and discuss that. But I think you already know what we've got to do is the right way to, of doing it. And all I can say, Madam Mayor, we want to make sure that we do have a town centre that people are proud of. And that is why we're making the investment we are making. It's so important to us as a borough, regardless of where you're from in this borough, that Wigan Town Centre thrives. And that is what we're planning to do, and that is what this council will give its support to. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Leader. I will now move to the vote on Councillor Wynne Stanley's amendment and remind members to please use the electronic voting system as a recorded vote must be... No, sorry. Um, a recorded vote must be taken for this item. Members, please vote now. The amendment is lost. We are now back to the original motion. Do any members wish to speak on the leader's original motion? Councillor Breeley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, this budget is... Um, it's unbelievable, actually. I mean, I've just stood, uh, Councillor Mullen, you say, accountable public funding has got to be accountable. All public funding has got to be accountable. Well, can you explain to me why public funding is being squandered on settlement agreements, telling people, sign this document, we'll pay you a lot of money, keep your mouth shut. What's going on behind closed doors? Councillor Breeley, can you speak on the budget? It's on, on the budget. No, on, it's on, all about on, funding. Not on your perception. It's all about public funding, Madam Mayor. No, we're on about the budget, not on your perception. No, we're on about, Thank you. Pu we're on about public funding. And I'm asking you a simple question. I keep asking everybody. We've even got Ed Legal Services telling lies. Said you don't exist. These sort of agreements don't exist. Well, I've got one, Councillor Mullen, you. And it's getting very serious now. Councillor you're Breeley, telling people this not question to speak has actually been answered by Council. the auditors for you. You've, this question has already been answered by the auditors. No, they've not. You've already No, the they've not, Madam Mayor. No, Can I have Councillor Breeley? I've issue. got a letter from legal services that don't exist. I have got one. Council I have got Councillor a document. Councillor Breeley, we have had this discussion at audit where you've had your answer. 
You've written to the auditors. You've had an answer for them. You've had an answer from the I'll finance officer. I'll take it officer. to the bloody it government is, now. Michael, it isn't a relevant I'll issue to bring before the this government. I'll be taking it to them. Leave Public money them. being squandered all the time. Can I it's vote a that Councillor Brealey is not heard? An Thank officer's you. telling lies. You can tell me not to be heard. I'm not bothered anymore. Councillor Brealey, can you sit down, please? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I've got a right to speak. I'm a councillor. We're talking about public funding here. We're not talking about money what's not being accountable. I mean, hundreds of thousands of pounds being thrown away. It's a disgrace, this council. And you need Councillor to be Brealey, you need to be I'll ask you one final time what goes to on. please and sit down. I bet down you don't even know what goes on behind the Do any other members wish to speak on the leader's original motion? Councillor Wynne Stanley, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I, don't, I don't obviously oppose everything that's in the budget quite clearly. Um, however, um, it's, uh, it's interesting when Councillor Rahman said that this was uh, the most difficult budget that you've faced in years. Um, well, that's not the response I got from... Paul McKevitt, when I had a chat with him, I mean, I know he's an accountant, he nearly smiled. I mean, he did say it was, it was the best settlement that we've had since 2008. And I know there's many experienced members on that side that will know what 2008 means. And 2008 means that when we had a Labour government and we still had it for two years. But that was, and then we got the, and then we got the infamous note from Liam Byrne to say, sorry, there's no money. And that's, um, you, well, you, 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 no, hang on a minute, you've had your austerity bit tonight. I think, I think we can certainly say that this government has put austerity firmly behind it. When I look at the amount of money that this government has been spending over the last few years, I don't think any socialist could say we've still got austerity government. I mean, when I listen to Labour members tonight, all they, all they talk about, we've spent this, we've spent that, we've spent something else. You never tell us about how, you, how much money you get from the government as well. And just here, look at all the grants that we've had over the past few years. Yes, might, some of it might have to deal with COVID, and a lot of it's to deal with business, to get them going again after COVID. 28 million on grants that we've had. 21 million for business grants. We've had capital grants of 10 million for the A49. 15 million for the M58, which I'm pleased to say is still going ahead. So the fact of the matter is we are getting money from this government. So, and we've also got the new homes bonus money as well, the three million which has gone into children's services this year to help prop that up and to sort those problems out. And that's welcome and we need to, and we do need to sort that out. So it's therefore disappointing that the council this year will be uh, increasing it council tax. I, I could probably live with the 1% on social care, but what, what I can't, what I can't support is the general precept increase because we've also got, we've talked about the cost of living tonight, and this is a global problem as well, it's an international problem. So we've talked about the cost of living crisis tonight, and yet we've got a Labour mayor in Manchester who is increasing his precepts again. You know, he was only elected last year, didn't say anything about increasing his precepts, he's putting it up again. Yes, I can understand the police element of it, but not the 12 pounds he's putting on for himself. Time and time again, he likes to put his hand in other people's pockets. And unfortunately, people in this borough are paying the price for Andy Burnham's spending sprees once again. So unfortunately, we can't support the budget and no one's talked about that. You've talked about cost of living, but once again, we've got an Labour, elected Labour politician putting this up. And it's also difficult to argue for a rising council tax when we're still producing borough life at £55,000 a year. And I know £55,000 a year doesn't, doesn't make any difference to, you know, it's, it's small fry. I appreciate that. But seeing as you've got to save, what, 1% to 2%, every little helps. That's the efficiency savings that we've got this year. But, and I'm glad Councillor Cunliffe mentions the issue about um, social care because... You might not like the government's plan, but it is a plan. And we know the Labour Party voted against more money for the NHS, and they voted against more money for social care because they opposed that particular element of it. But at least they've got a plan. You might not like it, 
The Labour Party don't have a plan, so we can't judge that plan. Their spokesman was asked nine times and couldn't come up with anything. Well, there's no surprise there because I'm still to see anything that they've, that they've come up with as of yet after uh, two years after the general election. So, but we've talked about cost of living and the one thing that will directly help people this year in this borough is the rebate on council tax that people are being given. And in this instance, Councillor Cunliffe is absolutely right, and I'm glad he's backed up my maths on this, because yes, it's about 85% of people that will directly receive this money, money in their pockets. So they've listened to the red wall voters where you've got a low council tax base and having to address it, that's what they've done. So Madam Mayor, I like elements of the, it's a bit like the curate's egg, it's good in parts, but sadly, I can't support it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Gerard. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yep, as uh, Councillor Winstanley says, we do welcome parts of the, uh, the budget tonight. Just to pick up a few points, what the cabin, Cabinet member said tonight, namely uh, trees. I don't think we've nowhere near met our target for the uh, million trees. In fact, we're chopping them down in places and putting up clean earth zone signs. So uh, I think that needs to be addressed immediately. Uh, the Our Town scheme, fantastic. As you know, we, we pushed for something similar with our motions back in 2018. But we should never get into a stage again where we have to spend so much money for the general upkeep of our town centres and estates. I'm glad to see other districts being targeted, but we can't forget about the ones that we've done last year and let them fall into disarray again. We've got to have a baseline of general maintenance in our town centres so they can stay at that level, just like you would do with your normal home. You repair it as you see it. Uh, the deal. Yeah, I mean, you touched on it, Chris but are you implemented it and all this, but the real heroes of the deal are the volunteers who go out volunteering. And we've got to emphasize that even more than what we had. We've, we've, over the COVID period, we've let that slip a little bit with the deals and getting people looking after their own, own spaces, parks, green areas. So I think more emphasis on that again and getting community groups up and running again, who might be scared to go out back into the community, helping out. But I think we really need to do that. Queen's Jubilee, yep. Yeah. Obviously, I, I didn't get the 250,000 pound, but see what, what you come up with, Councillor Reedy. Uh, Councillor Anderson, uh, antisocial behaviour. As you know, we've been trying to be quite tough on antisocial behaviour in our ward. Uh, but as probably every member in this, this room realises, the AS, ASB now is going on to serious crime knife, guns in, in some places, you know, it's really scary out there and we've got to make our estates and streets as safe as possible by uh, any means possible. We cannot see this get out of control and I really hope we can get, get a lid on it. And I'm, I'm pleased to hear about the 98 extra officers, that would be most welcome, especially in Hobbiton if, 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 you, if you can. Ten, if you can. <laughs> Uh, but we did touch on about accountability. As you, this last week, the world's changed. I think it's going to change forever with uh, what's happening in Ukraine. 134 million pound on the galleries. The, the building costs on that now, with everything going go, go through the roof. We really need to look at: is that going to be viable over the next coming years? It's going to, the material cost alone is going to skyrocket. And we might find ourselves out of budget on that. Uh, and also, probably not going to like to hear this, but China has not said anything about the attacks on Ukraine. And it doesn't sit well with me, with the, the company that we're using with the galleries. So I would like to see that altered again. And let's see where we end up in the in six months' time with the galleries and just put a lid on it for the time being. Thank you, Madam. 
Thank you, Councillor Gerard. Is there anyone else wishes to speak? Councillor Cunliffe, sorry. Thank you, couldn't resist. So Michael, Michael comes out with the 2008 Labour government and what they did then and in Dean's letter, responding to a global pandemic, nothing that the Labour Party in power did. And if we want to go back in history, because we're now 14 years on from that, if we want to go back in history, after the Second World War, the Labour government of Clem Attlee created the National Health Service, built a million houses, and that's the type of Labour government we want to see. And as for your concern, your, what you say about um, the council tax, and you agree with the 1% for social care, even though it's inadequate and not enough, uh, and the fact that the council taxpayers are going to have to pay that, but you're not happy with the 1.99%. Well, let's see how many Tory councils around the country levy the full element. Let's see how many. Let's see, how, let's see what Bolton do. Well, Tory Bolton, let's see what they do. And, and in actual fact, you point out that 85% and the generosity of the government in giving the discount to uh, everybody. Well, that's because down in the south, with high property prices, they'll be receiving far more in council tax than we do because we come from a low base. And I'm not sure whether you're quite deluded or, 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 or putting forward, and I mean, I, I do come with a professional background, so I'd need to do some, I'd need to do some more assessment on that. Or, or whether you're just uh, whether you're just coming out with Tory central office uh, yeah. propaganda and lies. So the social care plan, it's not that I don't like it. It's that it won't address the issues in social care. And for people of this borough to have an £86,000 cap on your care costs, Remember, it's only your care costs, it's not the hotel costs, the, the food, the heating, the lighting, everything else that you have to pay for, the care costs. The average property price in this borough is about £165,000. So if you're a couple that are going to require care, you will hit the cap when your property value is wiped out. So this idea about having, uh, about Johnson saying, you know, we want to end people having to sell the property to pay for the care. In this borough, you're probably going to have to. If you live in a £1 million house in, in London or the home counties and you hit the 86,000 cap and your husband or wife hits the 86,000 cap, Whoa, you've still got 840,000 property value. So this social care package is not a plan to address the issues in social care. It's about protecting the property values of the rich in this country. And that's what it's about. It's not about providing social care for people who need it in this town. Councillor Reedy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'll not say you're deluded, Michael, but I will mention one thing. One of the things you usually uh, usually say in your speeches when we do stuff, bringing the old chestnut out, and I think you brought that out tonight with Borough Life, the old chestnut coming out. And I think one of the things, I know, I know you've got to bring it out, it's one of those things, it's a budget one, isn't it? And, and you'll know what I'm going to say, you know, that this is kind of valued by our elderly residents and people who get the information about councils. And if, and I will ask for that information again and we'll do some more research, if that comes back at one point that people don't value it and people don't read it, we will look at displacing it. But to, the evidence we get now is that it's not. But I knew you would bring that anyway, so I just thought of it. But I don't think you're deluded anyway. Don't worry about that one. Uh, Stuart, uh, you're quite right. Uh, the world is changing and, and the volunteer sector is changing and we all get, have to get back if you like to, but there's been a lot of work done 
within COVID with our volunteers. And, you know, you look at our leisure staff, a lot of them were redeployed through the care sector and everything like that. So there's probably been more work going on. And when you said the kind of deal and let's get back to it, I think what we did within COVID was about the deal principles and everything that we did to back all that up. But you're quite right, we need to kind of get out there and I've got all the community staff now and the tenant engagement and Susan's working with them to kind of rebuild that and there is a lot of rebuilding. The Jubilee, like you said, uh, we, we only got it on 24 hours on the back of years, but we clearly didn't because it was being worked behind the scenes. But uh, I w what I will say is it won't be the amount of money that you're looking for. Uh, but what I will do is give you a proposal tonight, which you might like, and you can discuss with your colleagues. We've been discussing for a long time the Atherton money and the criteria behind that, and it takes a lot of building. If you want, I can bring that to the next cabinet meeting and take £250,000 out of the Atherton money to distribute around the wards for our Jubilee Red celebration. So we can all have ten grand of that money. So there is a proposition that you can turn back to your colleagues. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Reader. Councillor Brealey, you've already spoken on the original motion, so I'm sorry you can't speak now. I'm sorry, but... No, you, you spoke on the original motion. Well, I'm sorry, Councillor Brealey, you can't... No, you can't do that. You know the rules, so please abide by them. You've already spoken on the original motion, so you can't speak again. Councillor Hunt, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, it'll come no surprise to, to Councillor Lindsay that I'll be supporting the budget tonight. Uh, it, it's, I'm not going to say it's, it's one of uh, the, the best or anything like that, but there is some really positive stuff in there. If you look at the stuff around no cuts and no redundancies, that's, uh, that's absolutely outstanding for me in terms of the Council delivering that. You look at the commitment to apprentices again, and there's a lot of passion about that, getting young people into work. The police, the extra police, they'll, they'll certainly be welcome. And uh, the long overdue clean-up from one is uh, the town centre, so I'll be looking forward to that. And, and I don't swallow the stuff about the help that's been given in terms of what they've done uh, because of the energy prices. You don't have to look, if you want a proper example of what a government should be doing, just look to France, what they're doing. So it's, it's sort of half-hearted what the government's doing, it, and it's, it's way short of what's needed. But with the town centre, there's a lot of passion about the town centre and there's been a lot of controversy about the new development and, and, I, and I was torn between the two really because I've brought up with the town like many people in this room but we, the, the option to do it, we, we can't just sit back and do nothing we have to do something and I know uh, Councillor Lynch is passionate about the market and, and seeing its survival and so is many of us in, 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 this, in this room tonight but that, you, you want to have a think about that about the, you know your amendment tonight I know I couldn't speak on it but you, you basically, that was a wrecking amendment, 75%. You should have asked for, for something a bit, you know, where we can work together to, to, to look at that. And, and as, as regards Holt and Borough Council, all that tells me is they're struggling just the same as us. And they want market, they want people in their market. It doesn't say their market's any better than ours. But I can assure you that there's a lot of people in this room tonight that are as passionate as what you are in terms of the survival of that market. But I will be supporting the budget tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. Councillor Prescott. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Can I just respond to Councillor Gerard's comments about, about the, the, the one million tree planting scheme that we, we announced uh, a short while ago? Can I just let you know that at this moment in time, the figures I have, uh, Councillor Gerard, is we've planted 80,000 trees to date. That's in spite of the pandemic and the problems that caused staff were then needed for other areas of that were more important. And I will say this, that it, the scheme itself is based over a 10-year period. So 80,000 trees is not a bad figure to achieve. That will, that will increase. Now we've got panda, the pandemic out of the way, hopefully. I'll keep advised on it anyway. Thank you, Councillor Prescott. Councillor Raymond, you have reserved the right to speak at the end of this debate. Do you wish to speak now? Thank you, Councillor Raymond. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So, Councillor Wayne Stanley, you rightly quoted me saying that this was one of the hardest budgets we ever had to set. But only because we did it successfully and Paul was smiling when you talked to him. It doesn't mean that it wasn't difficult, it wasn't challenging, it just means we are bloody brilliant at what we do. <laughs> you, you 
mention the support received from the government, which was welcome. However, it is less than a quarter of what they have already cut from our budgets. And these are only one of grants. So thank you, but no thank you. Here we are expected to thank the government for giving back what they've already taken from us. And you are right. The government has injected a lot of cash, and I mean a lot of cash, in local councils. But I would say that front-loading councils up front with upfront grants and opening the spillways of money as soon as the pandemic hit was an admission by your government that Northern Powerhouse didn't work, that a decade of austerity has failed communities, that leveling up, whatever that means, would not deliver. So thank you for your contribution, but I don't agree with you. Thank you, Councillor Raymond. Leader, do you wish to sum up on your motion? I most certainly do, Madam Mayor. Thank you. I think one thing that... Uh, I, I'm just going to carry on. I'm not sure whether he's going to make a lot of noise or not, but empty vessels normally do. But can I, can I, just, can I just say... Can I just say I just want to sum up? So I'm not, I'm not sure what you're going to do about Councillor Bailey's behaviour, but you, I thought we'd ask... Do we not want him to be heard? And the answer we, to that is we yes. We have leader. Thank you. Thank you. No, you haven't. Thank you. We've actually ruled that you're not being heard. Can you please be quiet, Councillor Breeley? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think perhaps one thing I should have put in the budget was the cost of a spirit level. And I was going to send it to the Prime Minister because that's the only way he'll understand what levelling up is in terms of what we should do. Let us be honest. Since 2010, this borough, in funding that we've not received, has lost £450 for every person in this borough. That's what we've lost. Levelling up probably gives us 30 quid a head. That is the difference. And when Michael earlier spoke on his amendment about public funding, he then comes into this part of the meeting, talks about the money the government have given to us and given to businesses. Well, I'll tell you, a lot of those businesses had to go through an eye of the needle to get the funding that they should have received. Very, very clearly. But yet, we want to give away public funding without any credibility. All I can say, Madam Mayor, and what I will say to the opposition, if you vote against this budget tonight, you're voting against 100 apprentices, you're voting against 770 new social homes, you're, you're voting against your communities receiving a million pounds from the Community Recovery Fund, education receiving less funding, social care receiving less funding if you don't support this budget. Don't pick and choose what you want to support. What I will say, Mr. Madam Mayor, this is a good budget delivered by a good council, delivered by a Labour group that wants to support every person in this borough, Madam Mayor, and I move the budget. Thank you. Councillor Breeley, Councillor Breeley, I've asked you, please keep within the rules. I will now move to the vote on the original motion and remind members to please use the electronic voting system as a recorded vote must be taken for this item. Members, please vote now. The motion is carried. Thank you. That concludes the business before us tonight. Thank you for your attendance and a safe journey home.